Well, good morning, uh, colleagues, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who are with us uh, in, here in the chamber at City Hall, and also those who are watching uh, virtually. My name is John Tory. Uh, I'm the mayor, and as such, I'm chair of the executive committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, uh, so I will call the 32nd meeting of the executive committee to order, and again, welcome everyone. Uh, today's meeting is being held with members of uh, council and city staff participating both by video conference and in person at City Hall in the council chamber. Uh, the City Hall is open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the meeting in the Council Chamber at City Hall today. Uh, the public may also continue to participate uh, virtually, electronically by video conference. Uh, the meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. The clerk staff have connected remote public speakers to the meeting by video conference and there are public speakers in the room with us today. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Executive Committee's page at toronto.ca forward slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. I ask for everyone's patience as we have for quite a long time now if we experience any delays or technical problems uh, during the meeting. The City Clerk has provided all agenda materials via the Clerk's meeting portal and Clerk's IT staff will be available to participants to help with your devices. As a part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or to speak. I will then create a speaker's list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure that they turn on their video uh, and to raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, as you know, this is a paperless meeting and I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Uh, staff are available at exc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are in different locations and some participating virtually, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the tra traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, I will ask if there are any other members besides myself, because I do have an interest to declare today, if there are any other members of the committee who have interest to declare under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. If you do have an interest, please raise your hand and unmute your mic. I'm just looking at the screen. I see nobody on the screen. I see no one in the room. I will declare uh, the one interest I have to declare, which has to do with uh, item EX32.1, Connect TO Program Update. Uh, and uh, I... Uh, we declare a conflict because of my continued uh, involvement with the Rogers family, trusts and companies, uh, and out of an abundance of caution, uh, that obviously relates to Rogers Communications as well, which provides telephone and cellular and internet services within the city. I have the appropriate papers to file with the clerk. And uh, I will, what we'll do, since that, I, that item is first up, is I will absent myself from the chair after we do the rundown of the agenda and we'll uh, then uh, take no part in the meeting for that one item and then I'll come back and resume the chair. The Deputy Mayor will chair the meeting uh, for item uh, EX 32.1. Uh, so are there any other interests? Okay, on we go. We need a motion next uh, to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on March 30th, 2022, moved by Councillor McKelvey. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Before we uh, begin the rundown, the City Clerk has advised me that additional materials are available for the members' review in the Clerk's Meeting Portal for the public as well. Uh, there's a couple of things there. First, there's a motion by Councillor Crawford, which has been advanced circulated on item EX32.12, Extension of Exclusive Food and Beverage Services Agreement with Spectra Food Services. Uh, the motion has a confidential attachment, which is available for review on CMP. Uh, the clerk staff will also email members and their staff to advise that these materials are available. I would also draw attention uh, of the members to uh, some materials, uh, communication that's been received and that I have put on the record uh, for item uh, 32.6, EX 32.6, concerning uh, some uh, advocacy that we've been engaged in with respect to financing for supportive housing. And I think if you go and look at that communication, which I will speak to later, and I'll have a motion later on that item, you'll find there's some good news there from the Government of Ontario. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, and you can have a look uh, at uh, that material as you wish. So let's uh, go through the agenda and uh, uh, deal with the items that we can deal with and hold the ones that need to be held. Um, item EX32.1, uh, I will absent myself, and since it's just better for the record, uh, that even someone else should hold that for speakers. There are eight or nine speakers, and Deputy Mayor Bylaw will hold that for speakers. That's EX 32.1. Uh, 
uh, EX, just flipping the pages here, EX 32.2, implementing tenants first, Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation will be held uh, for, for deputants. Item EX 32.3, removal of Harbour uh, lead line and Keating rail yard. Uh, it, it, there is a supplementary report with recommendations and there is a speaker on that, so that will be held down as well. Uh, item 32.4, 2022 education property tax levy and clawback rate bylaw. Uh, this has not been held down for any reason and if not, we can uh, we'll deal with that. So moved, moved by uh, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item EX 32.5 is uh, the remuneration and expenses of members of council and council appointees to agency boards and other bodies for the year ended December 31, 2021. Uh, this is the recommendation here is simply to receive this report for information. May I have a motion to receive it for information? Moved by Deputy Mayor Menon Wong. Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 32.6, I'd mentioned earlier on, we will hold that down because there is the new communication and because I have a motion uh, in that regard. Uh, item 32.7, EX 32.7, a Civic Lab TO advancing a culture of innovation and collaboration uh, is being held down for deputants. Item EX 32.8, Toronto Water 2021 year end capital budget and 2022-2031 capital plan adjustments. Uh, there is no reason to hold this down. Uh, there are some budget committee recommendations. Councillor Crawford, would you like to move those? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Uh, Councillor Crawford will move the recommendations uh, contained in the report from the budget committee. If there are no speakers or questions of staff, we can call the question on that. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Item 32.9. Uh, is adjustments to capital budget carry forward funding and future year commitments also coming in a ledger letter from the budget committee um, and if there are no questions or people wishing to speak I'll ask uh, Councillor Crawford again to move hold the that. recommendations from the budget committee. Mr. Mayor, so, hold that. Yep. I have a couple questions for staff. Uh, and that was Councillor Pasternak. We'll hold that down for some questions of staff from Councillor Pasternak. Uh, on to uh, item EX 32.10. St. Lawrence Centre for the Arts Redevelopment Create TO. And there's a supplementary report uh, here as well. Uh, are there people wishing to hold this down for questions or comments? Yeah, Ms. Uh, I'll hold it down. All right, thank you, uh, Councillor Crawford. Uh, item EX, uh, there we go, let's keep looking at the pages here, 32.11. Amendment to the Master Agreement with the Canadian National Exhibition Association and the City of Toronto to provide for a one-year uh, extension. That's between those two organizations. Uh, is there anyone wishing to hold this down? Seeing no one, then I, could I ask that uh, uh, somebody move the recommendations coming from the Board of Governors of Exhibition Place? Moved by Deputy Mayor Bylaw. I'll call the question. If there are no other comments or questions, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item EX uh, 32.12. Uh, there's a, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's a motion uh, from uh, um, Councillor Crawford on this uh, that has just newly been posted to the portal. Do people need time to have a look at that? And there's a confidential attachment to that too. We'll, well, perhaps we'll just leave that. I think it should be fairly routine, but we'll just leave it so people have a chance to have a look at it. Uh, item EX 32.13, a multi-year license agreement with the Royal, Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Uh, this is again coming uh, by virtue of a letter from the Board of Governors of Exhibition Place with recommendations on the approval of a five-year license agreement with the Winter Fair, 2023 to 2027. Uh, and uh, dealing with the city's support for the Rural Agricultural Winter Fair. Are there any questions of staff or uh, comments people wish to make? If not, can I ask someone move the uh, Board of Governors uh, rec recommendations that are in the report? Moved by Councillor Crawford. Uh, if there's no other comments, I can call the question. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Item 32.14. Uh, considering all uh, growth fund related, fund related, sorry, all growth related funding tools at the executive committee. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a really a housekeeping matter as it were, uh, to um, allow us to have here at the executive committee, uh, the statutory hearing required under the planning act and so on, uh, as opposed to having it dealt with so that we could deal with everything together here at the executive instead of having it in two places. Um, so I think it is fairly technical, but I'm not trying to stop anybody from asking questions or holding it down. If not, if, if, if people are content, then I would ask, uh, I'll move the recommendation since I've made the recommendation here to move it to the executive committee. And I'll call the question. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Carried. Um, item uh, 32.15. Um, I think, uh, where's Councillor Ainsley? There he is on the screen. I think you're going to have a motion on this, Councillor Ainsley? Right here. I do. do I'm do you, uh, more than happy to move a motion. I think we, we can, can put the motion out and dispose of the matter if there's going to be a lot of discussion, which I don't think there will be. Uh, so do you want to do that, Councillor Ainsley? There's the motion up on the screen. Yep. Um, and it, I'll just read it so that people are clear what we're doing here. That the Executive Committee requests the General Manager Parks, Forestry and Recreation in consultation with the City Clerk to report directly to City Council at its meeting on May 11th and 12th, 22. Uh, on current processes regarding tree removal permit appeals and key considerations related to community council delegation. This is a nice way of saying there's some issues to be discussed there and that we'd like to have a report that gives a bit of background uh, so that we're not considering it in kind of a quasi a vacuum, but that the matter will be taken up at council with the supplementary report in hand. Is that fair, Councillor uh, Ainsley? I, I couldn't have said it better, Mayor. Well, Tom. you probably could have. And do you wish to say anything with respect to your own <laughs> motion? No, I'm fine. Okay, nope. so unless there's anybody else wishing to speak, uh, it is essentially putting it over with a report to come to council and I'll call the question on that. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, item 32.16, uh, empower TO, uh, and uh, that is being held down for a speaker. And so uh, we would then uh, proceed with the agenda then with some of those items having been disposed of. And I will at this point uh, is, uh, absent myself from the chair and turn the chair over for the purposes of item 32.1 uh, to uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Menon Wong. And do you have, uh, Deputy Mayor, do you have a list of the speakers? Because I have it in my hand, but that doesn't help you much. I do. Okay, I so do you're all set list. to go, and I will uh, see you all uh, in a while. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I'm going to handle. Uh, EX 32.1 Connectio program update. Um, we have, I believe, three, six, we have 10 speakers. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go to speakers first. Um, just uh, in, uh, just so you know, uh, I'll be moving a motion to adopt the um, <clears throat> supplementary report um, just to give everyone notice on that. Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, uh, I just wondered, could we get maybe just staff to do a quick five minute presentation to kind of set the table in terms of where we are and then we could have speakers. Uh, should you like to do that first? Yeah, please. It'd be nice okay. for them to frame it because this is not the first time the matter has been in front of us. I'd like to maybe have them speak to the changes. They have made some changes it would be helpful. Are staff prepared to present? They should always be. <laughs> hey, would, it, would that be Mr. Atta? Is he there? Or Ms. Scholey there? To the chair, uh, Lawrence Atta is here. Lawrence, you're on mute. If, uh, uh, Josie, in the event that you don't have a formal presentation, maybe just a brief. Uh, Brief summary would suffice I, uh, because we didn't give you notice, so you know, to pull out a deck. No, <laughs> make, you know, in the air, we're not expecting you to do that if you don't have one ready. Thank but you. But if you can just provide a, a brief sub summary of what the changes are, and, and in this, we, in we will do. I'd be happy with that, Mr. Chair. So, Deputy Mayor and our Chair, we will do that, uh, and uh, Lawrence will do that, and I'll augment. Thank you. Great. Floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, through the Chair. And just a very much a quick summary. In coming back with the supplementary report, um, what we've aimed to do is focus on the fact of uh, we've deleted uh, the first and second recommendation to ensure that we framed based on clarity in terms of the word that happened to be uh, caused some confusion and some discussion in Municipal Broadband Network. We are focused on the fact that the city is utilizing its existing fiber to leverage interconnection to ensure that we are secure, reliable for internal city services. That's very much the first focus in terms of utilizing the city-owned fiber, uh, city's fiber that has been utilized since the 90s for critical services. So we wanted to frame this supplementary report to specify that it's for internal services to continue to keep the city secure, reliable, and safe, which aligns in terms of the oversight role that has been um, stated in the city for the chief technology officer in utilizing the city assets. 
the next component of the report that focuses on any leverage additional capacity can be used to bridge the digital, digital divide in terms of the public. And that is a second focus in terms of bridging, which is the objective of the Connect to your program. It is also very clear in the supplementary report, the city is not proposing to be an internet service provider, specifically delivering internet service to the home. It has never been the intent of Connect to your program, and it's not the intent of the city. Through the digital divide, the city is aiming to then create an opportunity to continue to leverage its assets to help in terms of access and affordability in terms of improving that aspect. There are other parts within the report that talks about continue to work with the federal and the provincial government in advocacy in terms of broadband. And then is essentially um, the report also has addressing in terms of the motions that came at the previous exec committee which speaks to the time frame of coming back in the next budget cycle in 2023 with a business case in leveraging any specific um, additional assets from the fiber. So again, just to finalize, the city is not proposing to be an internet service provider. The city is proposing to utilize its existing assets to leverage um, interconnection and provide services for critical and essential services that the city has conducted. And the city is looking to continue to develop the Connect to your program as a way of excess capacity to help bridge the individual divide in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Atta. Um, so uh, we will um, go back to the, you know, the regular scheduled hearing deputants, and then we'll have questions of staff, etc. Uh, we're seeing no objections. I will go to and um, I'll go to our first deputy. Uh, Bob Murphy, Toronto Acorn. So, uh, deputies have um, just to restate, deputies have have five minutes to speak. There's a timer there. Um, after speaking, um, and after five minutes, I'll, I'll tell you to stop if you could, or if you could stop sooner than that. Then, uh, committee members will get the opportunity to ask deputies members. Deputies don't get to ask the committee or the committee members questions. So. Um, Mr. Murphy, welcome, and you have five minutes. Are you there? Yes, thank you. Am I in the right spot? Awesome. Uh, we can hear you, so you're on. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful to be back here at City Hall again. It's been a long time. Uh, good morning, councillors. My name is Bob Murphy. I'm a member of uh, Toronto Acorn in the York Southwestern chapter. Uh, what is ACORN? ACORN is a community union made up of low and moderate income, families fighting for social and economic justice. Why am I here today? I am speaking to you today in support of Connectio and how extremely important that this program move forward. Canada has some of the highest phone and internet rates in the world. I have to pay internet access before food, before nutrition. As an Ontario disability poverty prisoner, I work part-time as an outreach worker and I prioritize internet access before nutrition. I am fortunately on contract with a vaccination engagement team as an ambassador. And fortunately, our con some of us, our contract's been extended to the beginning of July. As an Ontario disability recipient, my priority list number one is food, or pardon me, my uh, priority list number one is uh, rent and shelter. Number two is cell phone. Number three is internet. Number three, internet. Number four is transportation. Number five is food, nutrition. What has internet access allowed me to do it gives me the opportunity to take online classes through the landlord or through uh, the LTB Learn for Life program. Internet access allows me to function greater in many ways and create access to many communities. Many uh, community members I engage will tell me all the time they just cannot pay the prohibitive costs involved, especially fixed income and Ontario disability recipients. I am on the West Park Rehabilitation Hospital Patient Advisory Committee. I am on the Brain Injury Society of Toronto 
Advocacy and Advisory Committee. I am on the Planning and Steering Commission for the Toronto Acquired Brain Injury Network 2022 conference. I would never be able to be involved in these great organizations without internet. The problem being is I have to sacrifice nutrition for access to the internet. We need we need a, a city uh, to be citywide, not just pilot project zones. This needs to be inclusive. Connectio needs to publicly be owned and publicly controlled permanently. I engage with uh, community members from all over Ontario and in New York Southwestern, and the common thing I hear all the time talking to individuals wake, uh, standing in line for an hour and 40 minutes for a food hamper. They just don't have access to internet. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of the deputy? Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Murphy. Our next speaker is uh, Earl LeBlanc, ACORN. Is Mr. LeBlanc here? One moment, Chair. Thank you. Oh, this is the host to Earl LeBlanc. You are currently unmuted. Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you're coming in loud and clear. All right, excellent. Um, well, thank you, councillors, uh, for having us. And uh, my name is Earl LeBlanc, and I'm a member of Toronto ACORN, uh, the East York uh, chapter. And as Bob outlined, what is ACORN? ACORN is a community union made up of low to moderate income families fighting for social and economic justice. Why are we here today? I am speaking to you in support of Connectio and how important that is, uh, how important a program that is. The internet is essential, and I will get into some of the uh, reasons um, I personally and why in general it's necessary. Uh, families need, um, you know, connection to the um, internet and uh, it's no longer a luxury. And uh, I'll just uh, get into what uh, my personal and generally what the requirements are. Um, so I wanna speak to you from direct experience and why the internet is absolutely necessary. The number one impactful aspect of internet for all is the idea that many of our social programs, if not all, are dr internet driven. So for example, the public housing crisis slash uh, the wait list is one of those. Um, I am on the wait list for public housing. Uh, it's way down the road, but nevertheless, I'm on the list. Um, so especially due to COVID, but also prior to it, there is little or no access to in-person appointments and so on with the city and the outreach offices for needs and requirements for, for housing. Uh, perhaps the most, um, pardon me, outrageous change uh, came um, when people were required to update their status on the wait list uh, over the internet. And uh, because that system, correct me if I'm wrong after, is totally computerized now. And uh, this is problematic because without access to the internet, if one can't update their file uh, with, for example, sending in their latest T4 and income status, uh, uh, they are sent back to the bottom of the list. And this is a challenge for especially older uh, seniors. 
Um, I am a senior myself. I'm 70 years old now and have uh, fairly good health, except for the minor issue here and there. Uh, but the day will come, I need groceries delivered or food delivered by Uber or whatever. Um, although that is becoming, Uber delivery that is, uh, becoming uh, cost prohibitive. I do everything online uh, currently, my banking, bill payments, sending uh, my daughters uh, some money now and then, getting my uh, updated insurance policy, paying for my street parking, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, again, there will be a time, especially in this high inflation environment, I will need public access and need internet for all. Uh, concerns for my fellow seniors is that the internet is essential to stay up to date with the variety of municipal and government services. Another real world example is finding legal services. I recently needed legal advice for a bogus five-year-old parking ticket. Um, so I went online, uh, got in touch with the uh, East York Legal Aid Center, and they referred me to a pro bono, much to my surprise, to a pro bono legal service. And they in turn emailed me the wording uh, I should use for the collection agency. And so their claim is now null and void. Uh, another example is video conferencing, which I'm using right now, and it's an invaluable tool to communicate for the disabled and elderly. Uh, people of Toronto can enjoy a better life with family via the internet. I have experienced this myself with family and friends, and just uh, something I left out, our monthly uh, ACORN meetings during COVID have also been uh, conducted via uh, Zoom. So again, uh, an essential service. Um, and lastly, during COVID, or actually it was prior to COVID, but then COVID happened, I was invited to join an art artist co-op. Sir, can I ask you to finish up? You're over five uh, Sure. Sure, just very quickly, um, uh, COVID struck and I was uh, um, involved in a uh, gallery, uh, in gallery submissions and that was, it all had to be done over the internet. So uh, the point is uh, for enjoyment, and socialization, avoiding isolation and so on. So it's an essential service. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh any questions? Oh, any questions of the deputy and I see Councillor Ainsley? Go ahead. Yep. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Wong. Um, to the deputy, sir. Um, so you you talked about how important internet connectivity is, and uh, I think you know we all understand that and we appreciate it. Um, so my understanding is the major telecommunications companies like Bell, Rogers, Telus, um, like Bell, for example, offers connected for success to people on ODSP and GIS, do you take it, do you utilize that program or either of those programs? No, I actually went to a smaller uh, company and get uh, very stable rates and excellent service. Um, pardon me, I forget their name off the top of my head. They operate, okay. out, of Ch Ch they operate out of Chatham, Ontario. And um, I get a standard rate of 55, it's gone up in recent years, but a $55 a month, which I believe is more reasonable than most. That's what I use. Okay. And you're getting a better rate from them than the connected for success with uh, Bell? That I don't know. I can't speak to that. I don't know what their rates are. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Those are, that's, those are my questions, Deputy Yermin Wong. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to ask, the, sir, uh, just another question. I think Rogers offers a, this, uh, this is dovetailing on what Councillor Ainsley said. Rogers offers a program of 10 bucks a month. Why wouldn't you grab that? I wasn't aware of it. For number one, uh, you, you're the first person that's informed me about that. 
Okay. Well, look, at, I mean, I, I don't want to be an advertisement for any of the major carriers, but you might want to look up low, you know, on your internet, low cost internet or ODSP, uh, Rogers, Bell, or whatever company you want. Cause you know, your the service, it, it's a lot cheaper than 50 bucks. So yeah, anyway, I, I, just leave, I just leave you with that. Earl. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's, well, it's fantastic because as a senior, I am getting uh, uh, my uh, pension and whatever savings I had is depleting rapidly, especially yeah. in this inflationary environment. But, okay, thank oh, you. I appreciate that. Pleasure. Um, so we're, I don't see any other, by the way, members, I, I'm sitting in the, my command center at home. Um, so if you, if, if I don't see you, if you just, uh, if you want to ask a question or what have you, please, uh, speak up. Um, the, our next, uh, deputy is Kiri Vad, Vadivelu. Is she, she with us today? To the chair she is, I'm currently connected. Kiri, if you want to unmute. Hello, Kiri? This is the host of Kiri. You are currently unmuted. So, um, you want to try one more time? Kiri, are you there? You have to unmute mute your mic. To the chair, we'll attempt to troubleshoot with Curie if you'd like to yeah, move on to the next speaker. Yeah, is uh, Alejandro Gonzalez Rendon there? Is she unmuted or is she available? Alex, you're currently unmuted. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you for listening. And uh, my name is uh, Alejandro Gonzalez Rendon. And I'm a member of ACORN, and uh, I would like to express um, why it's important to close the digital divide and why investing in a publicly owned broadband infrastructure is necessary to close this gap. Many residents in our community depends almost entirely on the internet for work and to generate income. For example, food delivery couriers who without access to affordable internet become more vulnerable to exploitation, not only because of the lack of work benefits and challenging working conditions, but also as a result of the high cost of the internet. During the pandemic, many freelancers and temporary workers continued working from home while ensuring a steady income. This allowed many low-income families to stay afloat just enough to weather the economic challenges that we all went through during the pandemic but nonetheless, it hit harder on marginalized communities. There, it becomes more necessary, therefore, than ever to have affordable internet to lift off the most vulnerable by accessing today's economic and job opportunities. Currently, the, the province of Ontario is changing the way education is, encouraging more online learning. However, Without accessible internet, many families are left behind because of the cost for internet is, is so expensive. And this leaves many students without access to an education or skills trading. We urge this city council to demand the provincial and federal government to provide the necessary funding to implement this technological and social innovation initiative to ensure in a student's opportunity for a better life. Also, during the pandemic, we witnessed clearly how important internet is for our health and well-being. Many were able to access health services while staying at home as doctor's appointments were made online. Many mental health service providers continue operating, although it took many time, although it took time for many to adjust to this new way of address mental health services internet access made a significant and positive impact in our lives, 
in, in regards with mental health uh, services. There are some low cost internet programs that benefit some families, but these are not enough to cover all. We have found very hard to have these programs like Access for Success at Toronto Community Housing or the Family for Success program that is supported by the federal government. But those programs leave many families and individuals out and we need universal access to the internet that is low cost, reliable and efficient. Again, the word here is universal and affordable for all. Finally, as a community, we recognize that the challenges and difficulties to get this ConnectGO initiative. Moreover, we understand that big telecommunications corporations will lobby hard to take control of this important technological innovation project. But we, ACORN members, families, and low-income communities will fight them back. And the predatory tactics by big telecom giants will not stop us, and you can be assured that we'll do everything we can to ensure access to a publicly owned, efficient, reliable, and low-cost internet service that is accessible and universal for all. Thank you very much, Consul. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, um, we will uh, go to uh, our next deputy, Baloo Bola Paul from Toronto Acorn. Is Mr. Paul there? There in the chamber, one moment, please. Great, thanks. Good day, councillors. My name is Biula Paul. I'm a member of Toronto Acorn in the East York chapter. What is Acorn? You've heard it before, but I need to reiterate. ACORN is a community union made up of low to moderate income families fighting for social and economic justice. Why are we here today? We are concerned after the last executive committee meeting when councillors were questioning the need for a program like Connect TO. I think all of us in this room depend on the internet for many reasons. Now imagine having to choose between paying for your internet bill or feeding a family or paying rent. This is our reality, as he heard one of my predecessors list the need for internet above his need for food. Affordable internet is so needed in the world we live in today. We need the internet for everything from applying to jobs, participating in community meetings, schoolwork, the list goes on. We hope that councillors will listen to us. This is a real opportunity for Toronto to help bridge the digital divide. ACORN helped win the federal Connecting Families program, but it's capped at 200,000, which makes us only 10% of all low-income families and seniors. It is nowhere close to being universal, and it is voluntary, which means some of the biggest telecoms just opt out of the program. This is why we're asking you to save this program and to continue with the rollout. And I wanted to answer the question about the $10 per month Rogers offering. This is offered only to the Toronto Housing community clients. And that's a shame. 
because there are other people who fall under the category of being low income and not being able to afford internet. Personally, why, do, why did I need internet? Why do I need internet? In general, I've been a, like a reluctant tech user. I'd rather go places and connect with people directly than go on the computer. But COVID forced me into isolation. And physically, I was fine with food, rent. Physical well-being was fine. But what about my mental health? Even if you're physically fine, if your mental health is lost, Everything is lost. We all know that from observing human beings, human condition. Just before the pandemic set in, I had the gift of a granddaughter. And for months, I could not see her. So internet was my lifeline. I was able to watch her grow, watch every step of her growth, all because I had access to internet. And then, as one of my predecessors said, meetings and so many um, events, like musical events, opera. Um, um, I'm also a member of Toastmasters. So imagine if I was not able to participate in those. My spirit would have just withered and I would be dead by now. And before I got, now I have full internet, but before that, I had the slow speed internet because that's all I could afford. And that one would take me five hours to download like a simple half an hour event. So I see my time is up. Um, I would just reiterate demands. Acorn is here to demand safe Connectio citywide access to internet, not just a pilot project access, make Connectio a permanently affordable program, not just for a few years. Connectio should be publicly owned and publicly controlled permanently. Thanks for lending me your ears. Thank you very much. Councillor Pasternak, do you have a question of the deputy? Uh, no. Um... Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, oh, if you could end? put me on the list for questions for staff when we get to that point. Okay, th thanks, Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Does anyone else have, uh... yeah, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the speaker. So what you're talking about is having an opportunity for everyone to have access to the internet service because there's a real need and you want to look at um, having equity. Is that correct? This is the host to Deputy Mayor Thompson. One moment, please. The speaker vacated the dais. <laughs> okay. We were a little slow, I guess. Yeah. Uh, may I have the question repeated, please? Yes. I was just asking um, what you're hoping for us to at least understand that there's a real need for equity to be provided with respect to the digital divide that exists. Is that correct? Yes. And one of the major steps at the moment would be to offer internet access to everybody because today we are dependent in every arena of our lives we're dependent on the internet right right yes. and um may i then ask um you now have uh, internet services is that correct i got lucky because uh, my daughter te taught from home from my home school teacher so she installed full internet at that time and she's paying okay. for it now, so I just got lucky. Okay, right. Okay, and and the the cost, as you understood it, what if your daughter wasn't paying the monthly? What would the monthly fees be for you? Eighty dollars. Eighty dollars. Yes. And when you look at the fact that you have to pay for um, shelter, cell phone, and so on, and so forth, and all the costs, it it, it is um, it's a challenge, particularly for those who don't have a lot of resources and there's a real need for government to provide some solution and that's why you're here today, is of that correct? Of course, certainly, yeah. Okay, great, those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, any uh, other uh, questioners from Council? No? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, is um, Mr. Clerk, is uh, Kiri Vit Vitavello, uh, is she, did you find her? To the chair, uh, we believe we've troubleshooted the problem and they're now connected by phone. We can unmute their phone line now. Great. Hello, am I coming through? Yeah, Kerry, are you there? Are you, Kerry, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, I could hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you've, um, you have five minutes and we're going to start your clock now. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, my, excuse me, my voice is, uh, voice is kind of scratchy today. Um, uh, I am a, I'm a SCOB, I'm a, I'm a Toronto ACON member and the, from the Scarborough chapter. Uh, and the reason I'm here today is to uh, speak about the importance of Connect to You program. Um, it's uh, the, the, the previous efforts that uh, Connect to You made was half effort and half intended to to implement. And what we see now is today's message uh, from the city is saying that uh, uh, there's no plan to publicly own uh, own internet and not to be internet provider. Uh, that is uh, very disappointing. That, actually, I was hurt to hear that because I was looking to hear uh, some some efforts put in the in that that uh, play, that avenue to have eventually provide a public owned uh, owned internet for for people of low income. Um, the, the reason why we need publicly owned internet is is uh, we know how the cooperation uh, works because uh, uh, there's the, the it, cooperation is all about uh, profit and uh, for example even housing is, is is even though it's supposed to be a human right it's a, it's a profit making commodity so again the same thing goes with the internet right now what we see is we have major internet providers but they don't want to provide any anything that is uh, that is uh, um, that is affordable for people so it's, it's a city that has to take the leadership uh, to provide that uh, that sort of uh, that sort of uh, um, uh, service, so that um, they can they can eventually compete. Uh, the problem is when city says uh, we don't want to own, we want to let the corporations run wild. Then we are not going to be people are going to be affected, and people, especially people of low income, are going to be affected. Um, I could share my thought, my experience about the internet during the pandemic eviction. And then, yes, we did have a pandemic eviction in Toronto. That is that is very shameful, first of all. Um, and I depended on the internet to attend the landlord tenant board hearing. And I had to make all my efforts to make sure that nobody in my family uses the internet, so that I can I can pro I can provide my case to the landlord tenant board clearly. And I, I was walking on an eggshell the whole time when I was pro providing the case. It's, it's again, uh, I have a shared internet among my neighbors in my in my apartment building. So if my neighbors was to overuse the internet, I would I would have disconnected that time. And 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 I, uh, that could have been very sad. It's um it's because uh, landlord tenant board even have a track record of everything dead people. So I I would I, it would be sad we had it, had the internet disconnected. But thankfully, that time internet was active for me, and and I was able to provide my case and protect my home. So, a lot of the services are dependent on internet now, and access to justice is so critical now that people, especially people of low income, we don't have access to justice. We don't have voice, and if we don't have this internet, then where where do we go? How do we get justice? I mean. When we go onto the street and say we are tired, we are hungry, we are angry, uh, we won't go away. That we really mean that. We we don't just say it, say it because they are nice. It's, it's a rhyme, but we actually say it because that's what we really mean. Because we don't have any other choice. And our city and uh, the councillors that I, I I beg you, please uh, have some ears and have some effort. Because I know when we speak one on one, we can understand. But we have a corporate culture that prevents uh, us from doing what's the right thing for the people. And that's something that we need to change, the culture. And talking about radical things that has done in the city, for example, 
uh, we had uh, our Toronto City Councillor cut cough recently, in the last two years. And we are still operating fine. But we could not uh, cut half police budget. Instead, we provided 20 million, 25 million just to support that. So I'm trying un, un, to understand where our priorities are. What, what are we are we providing uh, providing a world class city that that is accessible for everybody or just or certain group of people? And that this is this is very shameful. And the reason I'm asking for connect to you is it's very critical, and it really helps with the people of low income. And it, this has to be owned and provided by the city, so that uh, so so that major providers can eventually, hopefully, uh, be persuaded to do something. Because the, uh, corporations are not going to do that. A bank CEO who makes 15 million uh, a year will tell you how much we have to pay for bank account fees. I'm sorry that Econ, we fight for so many issues that touches the working people. So it's Sir, all interconnected. I'm going to ask you to finish up, I'm going to ask you to finish up please. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I will finish up my thoughts with one quote from Upton Sinclair. It is impossible to get, um, get one to understand something when salary depends upon not understanding the reality. So Thanks. I hope that is, the, that is not the case. Thank you. Okay. Any questions of the deputy? Councillor Ainsley. Yes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Minamong. Um, Sir, if you don't mind me asking, which carrier do you use for your internet now? Uh, yes. Uh, currently, I'm using uh, Virgin Mobile. It's a, sure. it's a small carrier. Okay. And do you mind if I ask how much you pay a month? Uh, yes. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my bill is uh, $79 a month, uh, but I was able to negotiate and uh, uh, I'm actually paying $20 less right now. So I'm paying about $59 a month now. Okay. So you're paying $59 a month for internet. And can I ask, um, are you familiar at all with the the Connected Families program that's promoted by the federal government? Uh, that's something that I'm not sure, but I would definitely look into that. Okay. And so I, I guess I'm trying to understand. So there's a program called Connected Families. It's promoted by the federal government. It's mandatory for all carriers to offer based on income. And I'm just trying to understand, you are not familiar with it at all? Um, no, something that I have not heard about. Okay. Uh, but and I'm, I'm perfect time hearing from you. And if you don't mind me asking, are you living in a TCHC building? Uh, no, actually it's a, it's a privately owned uh, apartment uh, complex. Okay. And does your, have you had any outreach from Bell or? Are you sorry? Also, do you mind if you don't mind me asking? Are you on? Are you receiving any supplements from the uh, income supplements from the from the government? No, we are we are not qualified to get anything at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's my questions, Deputy Mayor Minamong. Uh, th thanks, Councillor Ainsley. Yeah. Anybody else? No? Uh, yes, um, uh, Councillor Pasnak. Yeah, yeah go, go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to depute. Um, I'm on page six of the report, and I'm just wondering whether you're aware that our hundred library branches across the city offer free uh, internet service. Uh, if I could respond, actually. Uh, the library uh, library internet it's, it's not as, as actually having a home internet where that most of us actually uh, would be attending meetings and uh, here and hearings uh, so it again it, it, there will be a lot of limitations uh, but that's why we advocate for home internet that is more accessible for everybody in a, in a family rather than expecting to, to be in a, in a library or in another another environment for example we have we have free internet in in most of the malls but uh, the, the malls there the internet quality is so low that we cannot connect and most of the time the calls get disrupted so that those public large large wi um, uh, wi wifi uh, wi settings they don't provide the necessary quality that uh, the basic quality that's needed to connect 
Uh, they're good to look at the uh, Google map or they're good to look at some information, but when it comes to real service, um, uh, real need, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't provide ad adequate uh, quality of connection. All right. Um, are you aware that, I guess currently we really only have three community centers uh, that offer free Wi-Fi, but the plan is to add that, add free Wi-Fi to 140 locations uh, in, in the next few years. Are, are you aware of that, that plan? Um, actually, uh, I haven't had a full chance to go over the complete report, but, uh, but only I heard that from today's, uh, today's, uh, um, uh, today's uh, information through the mayor that uh, there's uh, other steps have been taken. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, what we are advocating for is a city-owned, public-owned uh, internet service that is reliable, that is dependable. Uh, but these these are services that uh, they 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 provide an illusion there's a service, but they don't provide the, the real solution, the the real need uh, for the people. Uh, so that is why it, it is. Uh, I'm not saying that they're 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 not uh, not really worth uh, um, um, well worth talking about. But they are very useful, good steps, but. They're far from the need today, but we have the, the far from the needs to, of today. I guess my next question is sort of more rhetorical, and maybe it's a question I'll save for staff, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, can uh, municipalities apply to the CRTC for a license to offer um, high-speed uh, internet service throughout their municipality? And I, I really don't expect anyone to answer that except maybe staff. I'm not even sure whether the City of Toronto is eligible to be a, a licensed supplier of, of, of uh, high-speed internet to the general public, but um, maybe that's a discussion for a little later in this debate. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thanks to the deputant, we're going to move on. Um, our next deputant is Bianca Wiley, Tech Reset Canada. Is uh, Bianca here? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Bianca. Hello um, there. You've been here once or Hi twice there. before. Um, so you've got five. You know the rules. So we, you've got five minutes. Thank you. I'm just starting your timer. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Bianca Wiley. I'm uh, the co-founder of Tech Reset Canada, and we're a volunteer group that's working on issues related to tech and society. Um, I've got three things I'd like to speak to. Uh, the first one is market failure. The second one is that this whole topic of the internet and internet access is confusing and complicated, and I think we need to work on how we talk about it. And the third thing is using what we have as a city through this Connectio program, which I don't think we've talked about enough, frankly, because um, this is really an exciting program, and I want us to be excited about it, uh, but that requires that we understand what it is. So I'm gonna come back to the first point about market failure. And I really need to, I think, you know, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Pasternak, I think maybe someone else. I'm hearing a lot of questions about, you know, why aren't people using existing programs? Um, and it's good that you're letting, you know, people know that they exist. But I'd like to reorganize the question back to you, which relates to something we've got going on later today, which is called Civic Lab TO, which is looking at our partnerships with research institutions as a city to better understand the issues that we've got to deal with. And over the course of this file, institutions, universities have brought back significant research saying that we have a market failure problem, a specific issue with affordability for the internet in the city. I, I, I need to understand why that research, which we're uh, apparently seeking to do more of, is not credible enough for you to acknowledge that we have a problem and that we need to work on it. Because a lot of people have been here before. And instead of using that research as a basis for how we're talking about this, I'm hearing you asking residents about communications issues, which I don't believe were what was pointed out by those who've done research on this topic. So it's good that you're letting people know that these programs exist. Um, there's a great op-ed in the Hill Times about why those programs are not covering everybody. 
So I just, I want to know why the research that has been brought to date is not enough and why we're stuck and spinning on problem definition. Because I would hope at this point in time, we can acknowledge that we have a problem. If you don't want the city to work on it, then say that, because that's different than whether or not we have a problem, okay? So that's the first point. To summarize, that is that we have a market failure. That's what that is. The second thing I want to talk about is that this topic is super confusing. It's been hard to watch these debates because we're getting hung up on not just you, me, everybody. This stuff is hard to follow. We're getting hung up on diagrams, wires, cables, speeds, the CRTC. Like, but we need to be careful how we're talking about this issue because staff never said in any of the reports that I've read that they were trying to duplicate efforts of Bell, Rogers, or anybody else. And if we're not careful with what we're actually talking about, we're getting the public engaged in a conversation that has no connection to what was actually being presented in these reports. I'm not saying it's easy for staff to present it. I'm not saying it's easy for me to present it. What I am saying is that we owe it to a democratic process to actually talk about what's on the table and the lines of questioning I'm hearing. And again, I invite all of you who have been doing this to answer as to why we're not even talking about what this proposal is. So that's sort of the last point. The third thing is, this is something that I would have thought, ideologically speaking, would have resonated with everyone here. The city has existing assets. They're thinking about how to leverage them to address an affordability problem that I would think everybody in this room or remotely joining cares about. That's what this is about. This is creative. This is a $725,000 pre-existing capital budget investment. It's very small. It's very hard. But staff are taking something on that is really innovative. This is what like innovation in governance looks like. And it's using what we already own. Why wouldn't we want to leverage our assets better? That's what this program is about. I really hope from now on we can focus on that. If you want to come and work with us in community on how to make this happen, it's going to be hard and it's going to take a long time. I really hope we can start to have the conversation as to what this program is. So that's my third thing. It's great. I'm so in support of it. I hope you will maybe turn that corner and then we can think about how to collaborate on it rather than having these other conversations. Thanks so much. Do you have any questions of the deputy? No? Okay. Thanks, Ms. Wiley. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Daniel Armstrong uh, with Beanfield Technologies. Is Mr. Armstrong around? Hello. Hi. You got five minutes, sir? Great. So, good morning. My name is Dan Armstrong, and I'm the CEO and CTO of Beanfield Metro Connect. We own and operate the largest independent fiber optic network in Toronto and Montreal. We connect thousands of buildings and communities, and we're proud to supply services to public, center, public sector entities, including the City of Toronto. The topic before us today is near and dear to my heart. It is ultimately intimately connected to the very reason Beanfield was created in the first place. Back in the 1990s, our home in Liberty Village was itself a connectivity desert. We understand what it feels like to be ignored by the incumbent telcos and the real harm it creates. It's why we exist. In 2022, being connected to the internet is as essential as clean water and electricity. We're completely in alignment with the goals of Connectio. We need to close the urban digital divide. There are other contributing factors too, poverty, housing, and affordability and literacy rates, but you, the City of Toronto, have the powers to address the high costs and difficulty of building fiber into underserved areas. We suggest four ways you can use those powers to help bridge the divide by lowering the cost of building fiber. By lowering the cost of building fiber, you are going to lower the cost to the consumer. First, Toronto Power and Pathways. Second, riser retrofits within tower renewals. Third, a fiber notice period to get everything built into towers at one time. And fourth, a utilities notice period so we don't need to dig up the streets so much either. Go over them one by one. First, there's already an extensive network uh, of pathways running throughout the city. Toronto Hydro, a city-owned subsidiary, owns and manages it. 
By using Montreal's Electrical Service Commission, the CSEM as a model, Toronto could have a highly coordinated, easily accessible and reasonably priced framework for fiber placement. It would significantly drive down the costs of network deployment. It would open up vast swaths of city fiber, but would, <clears throat> without labor costs and traffic disruption of the environmentally insensitive exercise of ripping up the streets and neighborhoods all over again to lay down additional fiber. We also think Toronto Power and Pathways is a catchier name. <clears throat> Secondly, include <clears throat> riser retrofits in tower renewal programs. Risers are the pathways uh, buildings used to bring utilities to various floors. Older buildings didn't run conduit to the individual units, but you need that conduit to build fiber. It's no coincidence that older buildings and fiber deserts go together. Even where fiber is close by, it's very expensive and often impossible to retrofit. By adding riser retrofits to existing tower renewal programs geared towards environmental sustainability, you get two benefits at the same time. Anecdotally, our office is right next to Parkdale, and we have thousands of strands of fiber running right past every single one of those buildings, but we can't get into them because the risers are precluding it. Third, use licensing and permitting to create a fiber notice period for new tower builds. The CRTC already prohibits exclusively, but big telcos and developers get around it with single telco bulk marketing <laughs> and distribution deals. That gives developers an incentive to make it essentially impossible for other carriers to enter at the right time. Shutting out competition and new fiber reduces the communications resilience of that community and means tearing up the streets multiple times. The city can solve that with a formal entry window for CRTC registered telcos. Fiber providers would have to let all new uh, telcos into the buildings during that construction window. And fourth, also use licensing and permitting to create a utilities notice period. Let telecom carriers equitably participate in already ongoing public utility trenching projects. Saves huge amounts of time, environmental costs, and building costs to add conduit when the ground is already open. This makes it cheaper to build networks and lets a lot more of them compete at no cost to the city. Remember, the input costs drive the output costs to consumers. We have strived to create a telco with equitable pricing and unmatched reliability to ensure fairness to all. In areas where fiber connectivity is abundant, among incumbent telcos, there is no doubt our presence has contributed to a substantial drop in pricing of all telcos. We want to bring the same thing to all of Toronto's neighbourhoods and think our competitors should be able to do likewise. Our four suggestions will lower the cost of deployment in order to long unlock investment and we hope create a truly connected Toronto. We're happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. I believe your colleague is going to speak next, Todd Hoffley. Is Todd there? You want to speak? I don't. No, no, okay. Actually, I don't think Todd has. He's given me all the speaking notes, so you've That's you've fine. heard our pitch. <laughs> all right, we're going to move on to Serge Cormier from Sky Choice. Denzel. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chair, can I just ask Mr. Armstrong a question, please? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. So, Mr. Armstrong, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. So, it seems to me that you want you and your company wants to be part of the solution. Is that could, can I take it from your comment? That's the case. Absolutely. We're. I have heard all of these people talking about how important this is to them, and I right. sort of feel like I'm jumping up and down, and I want to be part of the solution. Right. Um, and so may I then ask, have you made the pitch and or presentation and or have you had a conversation with any of our staff members, Mr. Etta or anyone else about what the concerns are and how um, costs could be reduced as part of a process when digging and trenching are taking place and or cables are being run, how that could actually help if you talk about input output? Has that conversation taken place? Uh, the initial conversations have taken place. Yeah, absolutely. I've been talking to some of the Connectio staff on things that we might be able to do as well. Right. So then um, it's safe to say then that they are, as you say, the conversation is taking place. They are amenable and there is some um, you know, opportunity to look at how this can be done. 
So it's more timing than anything else. Would that be safe to say? Yeah, absolutely. I think the conversations are happening and they're being, they're fruit, very fruitful so far. And I am very confident we can come to a great outcome if we continue the conversation. Right. So with respect to the report itself, ConnectTO, you and your team, I'm sure have sort of, you know, um, look through it and, and you, you, you sort of analyze it based on your professional expertise and, and, and so on. What do you say about the approach that the staff is taking? Is this the, a, a, you know, a positive direction in order to address the back end in terms of the issue around costs and how the city is leveraging its own assets to then address a fundamental problem that we are hearing from the speakers this morning? Yes, so I mean, a lot of this is in our written submission, so recommendations six and seven, mm -hmm. uh, but just very quickly, we believe that the approach of a shared conduit infrastructure is the solution. Sharing at the fiber level, we don't believe is going to work. Sharing at the conduit level, we think will be very workable. We would we love the idea that Connectio has to build a citywide conduit system for everyone to share. Our concern is that that may not happen in our lifetime, and you know that would is a project on the scale that would dwarf current transit initiatives. And we think that with just shifting that thinking over to uh, Toronto Hydro as a utility for conduit pathways is, a, you know, a more practical solution. I see. Thank you very much for your response to my question, sir. Um, those are my questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Uh, we, uh, anyone, anyone else speak up? Okay. Um, now we will move on. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have Mr. Cormier uh, around? Waiting. We do. One moment. Oh, yes. Just one moment. Okay, um, so are you able to to, um, to view my video? Mr. Cormier, uh, I will, I see you, but maybe the clerk will answer okay, that. Sure. Okay, sure. Okay. Do you have a presentation? Uh, yes, I, I do. So that's why I wanted to clarify before I begin. Uh, I would like to, I, I don't know over there because of course I'm here virtually, but uh, I would like to make sure that it's like full screen because I basically, I have a two minute video and then after that, about uh, three, up to three minutes, within three minutes, uh, um, a slideshow presentation. Sure. Uh, Mr. Clerk? So, to the chair, we can currently see and hear the speaker. We've also provided the, uh, we've also provided the deputant with the sharing right. So if they'd like to share a video from their computer, they can do so now. Okay, so that uh, share desktop, okay, just. Bear with me one moment while I do that. <clears throat> Just one moment, I gotta. I got a, there's like an access, uh, okay. Uh, and this is speaking to the, the um, ConnectTO program, right? Uh, correct, yes, exactly. It's not a, it, it's not a PSA. Sorry, just one moment. It's saying I have to, like, I have to sh um, provide some rate or something. Let me see. Oh, okay, I think I. I 
Uh, it's saying I may have to reopen. Okay. Sorry about that. Mr. Cormier, if you can't do it, maybe you just got to tell us because um, uh, we've got to move on here. Everyone gets five minutes, and you know you've we've been pretty generous with you, so you got to try and bring this to a close if you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's there now. Uh, sorry. Okay, it's 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 saying I need to uh, to go out and get back in. Perhaps um, perhaps you could move on to the next uh, 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 presenter on the list, and then I can go after. Okay, so Mr. It's Cormier, this, I have to sorry, Mr. I have to Mr. leave Mr. WebEx and, and go back in. Mr. Cormier, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to we're going to go to the next speaker. Yes. You can talk to the clerk. If you're not ready to go after that, then you could. Then I'll give you your five minutes but we're not gonna wait a whole lot longer for your presentation, okay? So you have to talk to the clerk about this. Um, Mr. Clerk, can you call him to talk or have someone talk to him offline, please? To the chair, we'll attempt to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next and last speaker is Miguel Avila Velarde. Is um, Mr. Velarde there? Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, welcome. Uh, you have five minutes. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for allowing me to speak. I sent my written submission in case I go over the five minutes time. I became aware on May 22, on May 2nd, an article in Toronto Star decided to pull the plug on plan for cheap, fast internet for low income Torontonians. I am a member of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association, RTNA. We have been actively advocating for affordable internet for the record. I want to thank you, the city staff who went public, disclosing this information to the public. So the recommendation is back at the table. City Council to endorse the proposed creation of a city on high speed municipal broadband network that will in the be happening sometime in the future. So the Connect TO program is aimed at people like my kids living in Scarborough at Councillor Michael Thompson's ward. 80 to 100 dollars a month for internet is impossible. Have you seen the prices of groceries lately at the market? The rate of inflation has gone up to 7.5 and it's becoming a luxury to eat. I pay for the cell phone services for my three children and it's expensive and it should be affordable in my opinion. So today let's talk about high fiber. I understand that the other company is trying to uh, install high fiber in Regent Park because some newer buildings have access to infrastructure 220 Oak Street does not have that facility. In 2019, TCAC hired a contractor to install high fiber by Bell. The plan was expensive and it was a failure because they had to drill from wall to wall to wall, 16 units at it by floor. And it was so costly that they had to put a, an end to the comp to the job. So only one floor at 220 Oak Street has access to high fiber internet for the record. If any of the companies here, Benfield, uh, is interested to, to learn more, how we can work together. See, 220 Oak Street has $30 million revitalization, renovation, capital project investment in 220 Oak. So, I'm sure that we can discuss ways to include this new service for all uh, residents of TCAC because I am part of the um, su uh, success for connection. It's a $10 service, correct? So it's good, it's Rogers, but I rather prefer to have high fiber internet because the way we are communicating is 
super fast and like this this meetings and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i would like to also to request the rogers please take care of their own infrastructure for instance we have connections boxes outside the building and time and time again they get vandalized because um subcontractors they forget to lock up the doors and that creates a situation of vandalism. And I see people from TCAC on the call. I brought them to the attention of the last TCAC board meeting that we need to improve the safety of these connection boxes because they get vandalized, tampered, et cetera, et cetera. So I do hope if we have a high fiber internet hub service inside the building, Many of these ongoing vandalism at 220 Oak Street can be eliminated or perhaps reduced because they will be inside the building. Therefore, there will be no situation we need to call the community safety unit for vandalism at 220 Oak. So also want to request to end the monopolization and control of the lobby cameras at 220 Oak. Open it up for competition so other companies can have access to the lobby channel because it's something that we use when we are getting bus from the main lobby door and we need to see who is um, trying to get into the building. So for the safety of the most vulnerable, I request this favor. Thank you so much for your time to listen to me. Uh, thanks very much. Any questions of the deputy? None. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Velarde. Um, we're going to go back to our last speaker, Mr. Cormier. Is Mr. Cormier ready? Mr. Clerk? To the Deputy Mayor, the speaker is connected. One moment, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cormier? Okay. Yeah, it's it's working this time. Okay. Well, That's you great. have five minutes. We're going to start your clock. Okay. Oh, just a second here. Okay. So are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for uh, the delay uh, as I had to restart my, my WebEx in order to provide the necessary uh, permission. Uh, so uh, I would like to begin. So my name is Serge Cormier. I'm founder and uh, CEO of SkyChoice Communications. I'm very happy to be here today uh, with uh, all of you and grateful for Toronto City Council to allow me to present in support of ConnectTO, this great initiative. But before I begin my slideshow presentation, as we're, you know, a smaller, lesser known provider, I would like to start with a two minute video to show what SkyChoice is all about. And then after that, I will go with a, um, uh, a slideshow presentation for about two to three minutes, and then I'll answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Sir, I, I just, I mean, the one thing I would say, if this isn't like an advertisement about who you are, this is not what this discussion is about. No, so it uh, it, it shows uh, the what we can um, um, uh, it, it it does explain uh, more about technology. So how technology can assist connect to. So it's 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 not like a promotion or anything uh, at all. So let's begin. We don't see things the way they are. We see them as they should be. We're engineers. It's what we do. With us, it's always faster this, smaller that, better everything. And the way we see it, the internet's in a rut, literally. The big cable companies are digging ditches to bring you high-speed internet. Digging ditch after ditch and wait. Well, we're not waiting. We're putting high-speed internet where it belongs, up on a pedestal. We're banding together, taking it to the state, shooting it across the country. And not just for some, for every 
in every corner. Why? Because being connected means everything. It's the great equalizer. Today's internet is not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's running businesses, schools, lives, and more. Way more. And it definitely doesn't have to involve waiting or burying cables or buying bundles. It takes new thinking hard work, and a dedication to lifting technology to new heights. The future is not faster cables, it's no cables. So we're climbing stairs, ladders, towers, and anything else that will allow us to connect you and everyone you know to affordable, reliable, non-bundled high-speed internet. It's your camp, wait. Air Fiverr is designed to be bounded up in a reasonably high location. It's a point-to-point -point network where the two antennas to each other that allows us to synchronously send packets so that the transmitted packets from both ends of the link actually can meet halfway in between in space. It doesn't have to wait to receive the packet before it transmits. Hey, Jeff, what's up? Thank you very much. Okay, so now I will uh, begin with my uh, quick uh, slideshow presentation. Um, so just to quickly check, are you all able to see my slideshow presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so a uh, quick introduction. So um, just to quickly summarize SkyChoice, we are an independent Canadian telecom provider based out of Oakville and we provide services across Canada. So we're an active member of several independent telecom provider industry organizations, such as uh, the Canadian Association of Wireless Internet Service Providers, CanWISP, and also the Competitive Network Operators of Canada, or commonly known as CNOC. And, and we have over 10 years experience offering high quality and low cost internet connectivity to underserved areas. Uh, with our Wi-Fi wireless fiber internet service. So now um, I would like to essentially summarize the main key phases as I was able to understand with this uh, revised submission by the Connectio uh, committee. So essentially Connectio will bring many benefits in connecting all Torontonians, um, but there are two main key phases for this initiative that we have to focus on. So the first phase is to decrease the city's reliance on external leased fiber uh, from the private sector in order to interconnect uh, the city's own fiber assets by either leveraging existing municipal works and right-of-ways in order to uh, deploy uh, physical fiber where it makes the most economic sense especially if there's uh, already existing uh, conduits uh, that you don't have to dig up the street or, or whatnot. And you have, you have 10 seconds, so you're gonna have to finish up pretty soon. I, I... Sorry, already. Okay, and uh, to uh, also deploy wireless fiber connections in between city-owned buildings where fiber physical fiber would be difficult or cost uh, prohibitive. And um, the second phase that we're looking at is to prepare the city's fiber assets uh, with a long-term goal to eventually allow private independent ISPs the ability to lease middle mile and possibly last mile capacity uh, to increase available connectivity options for Tronians. Thank you. Um, Sir, you, I've got to stop you. You're, you've gone over. I gave you an extra 30 seconds. So um, what we'll do is, if there are dep if there are questions from the committee, they can ask you questions. Um, sorry, so should I continue now? No, you're you're finished. Um, uh, are there any questions, uh, from the deputy? Yeah, Councillor Thompson. So through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Cormier, um, you were going yes. to tell us about. Um, I, I think you had on your slide something about decreasing. Uh, is a cost or service? Can you just expand on that to um, just complete that portion of your presentation for me, please, so I can have a greater understanding? Oh, sure. Um, no problem. Um, 
watch the second here. <clears throat> oh. Wow. Apparently fragmented which means that essentially there's bits and pieces of fiber assets uh, here and there throughout the city. And uh, in order to connect them together, currently uh, leased fiber is being used. Uh, however, there is a high cost when you lease fiber from the private sector. So Did we lose him? Mr. Clerk. Bad internet connection. It's I ironic, think. isn't it? Is that though? Um, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that his materials be yes. circulated uh, to the clerk. You know what, that's uh, a good to, idea. He can to, send it to us. To uh, committee members. Mark. I'm actually curious to, to, to read more about this, but I think we've invested. That's a great to... idea. Okay, thank you. So, um, I mean, we, I think we were fairly, the committee was fairly generous in trying to get him to connect and such. So we gave him more than enough time, but we've got yeah. to move on. Um, Sorry, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I have questions of the deputy then if he can hear me. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Okay. Carmier, yes. um, did your company, so there Sorry, was an Mr. 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 Chair, uh, I wasn't finished. Mr. Carmier okay. was making so, a presentation based on the question well, I asked him about the presentation. So I understand he, he had a, I mean, what we did was we ended it because he's got a bad internet connection. I, I understand, but and, I had well, a question. We can go about, back. I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in your hands. I, I don't sure. Want to, I, I just had one additional question, Councillor Ainsley, to, to ask him, and then you can take the floor. I wanted to ask Mr. Cormie through you, Mr. Chair, about the actual report itself. How is it that your company could assist the city in terms of achieving its objective and its goals? Thank you very much for the question. So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, th there is two phases for the for the implementation of ConnectTO. Uh, so, the primary phase and what we're focusing on now, because as I understand, uh, um, recommendations one and two were deferred, so we're not focusing on those ones as uh, as of now. So, we're basically focusing on. Um, increasing the asset value of the city's uh, fiber infrastructure by uh, reducing its reliance on uh, leased fiber assets. So essentially um, by doing so, by trying to as much as possible build the network so that all the assets are connected together using fully city owned uh, uh, infrastructure rather than leasing parts of it to the private sector, uh, the asset value of uh, the the, uh, the the fiber the city fiber infrastructure would be increased, while the uh, monthly operating cost would be decreased, which then those savings could then be reinvested into ConnectTO and uh, further uh, uh, reduce the digital divide in Toronto. Mr. Cormier, I understand all that. My question was, how will your company? aid or assist with respect to the city's effort to create this equity in the digital divide oh sure okay so as as i was explaining uh so um, um connecting the fiber assets uh sometimes when the the access paths or conduits or or underground uh, pathways are already in place um it's you know and the distance is not that great sometimes it makes more uh effective sense to uh to 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 use physical fiber to connect uh, those assets but in many cases uh there's no existing pathways uh that are available and uh in order to for certain parts of the network uh it, it would involve digging up the streets and all that which can actually cost up to $200 uh, a meter uh, to, to dig up streets and all that. That's based on the uh, city of Calgary's uh, figures uh, of their municipal network uh, a couple of years back. So 
for those segments of the network, this is where we at SkyChoice we assist because we would uh, be able to use our expertise in wireless high performance communications to de deploy uh, air fiber um, connections between uh, city owned buildings because um, many of the city owned buildings are tall enough to uh, establish uh, wireless air fiber connections between the buildings and to essentially uh, connect the, uh, the the city's fiber assets not only by physical fiber but also by uh, wireless air fiber in, in in where it makes the most economic sense and this is right. all the common goal of uh, being able to rapidly implement this wonderful initiative because uh, as you know the whole idea, the whole point of my presentation is the future can't wait. So uh, as I uh, stated earlier, I mean, uh, if if uh, if we move along with this, uh, I'm confident in about years, two to three years, that we would be able to implement a significant portion of this and, and achieve the wonderful objectives uh, that are um, with the uh, uh, ConnectEO initiative. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh Councillor Hensley, did you want to go? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Minamong. Uh, Mr. Cormier, the city issued a uh, NRFP, and I believe there was 45 corporate entities that took the paperwork back. Um, was Sky Choice one of those entities? Um, we did consider it. However, uh, as per my previous correspondence, uh, we uh, decided at that time that um, it wasn't quite um, ready to to go with that. Uh, reason being is that currently uh, there is um, uh, there are a, a few things that kind of impede uh, the ability to pro to deploy uh, wireless uh, uh, structures in the city. Uh, as per recommendation number eight, uh, we we of course with other um, with with other organizations, uh, we fully support that uh, that that recommendation be fully implemented, so that uh, the uh, kind of the roadblocks uh, that uh, we currently have in deploying wireless sites in Toronto are are reduced or entirely abolished. So sorry, Mr. Carmier, just to be clear, so you were one of the forty two business entities that looked at the nrfp you registered with the city and you took the your company took the paperwork for the nrfp and then decided not to submit is uh, that correct like like, like any other um like, like any other uh all of the other companies so we we decided that at that time that uh, there's too much work that needs to be done uh before we're able to um uh, to to proceed with this project so sorry but mr cormier sorry so we issued an nrfp there was 42 companies that registered took the paperwork and then didn't apply or s submit to that nrfp is sky choice one of those 42 entities did you no. register with the city and take the paperwork no, not not at the, not at that time. But we we knew the basic of the the basics of the initiative, and uh, we knew that um, in order to make this happen, um, that the uh, recommendation number eight, the uh, prudent avoidance policy for sitting telecommunications towers and antennas, um, uh, until that. Uh, recommendation is fulfilled and 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 it, and the uh, that policy is discontinued that we would not be able to do uh to 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 participate in 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 do what we need to do in order to make this happen okay and when we've had a lot of discussion around affordability this morning uh what's the the lowest offered package for internet that Sky Choice currently offers. Um, so currently, and this is un unsubsidized, uh, uh, the lowest would be at thirty thirty four dollars a month. 
uh, but that's of course just for a basic connection um, you, using our uh, Wi-Fi wireless fiber service uh, in place where we offer using the uh, uh, incumbent uh, uh, infrastructure like uh, Bell or, or Rogers, uh, the, the lowest cost I believe is like 45 um, for the okay, service itself. So, Those yeah. are my questions, Deputy Mayor Minim Wong. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Anyone else want to have a turn? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Cormier. Um, we are now <clears throat> exhausted our deputations lists. Um, we will uh, take this into committee and we'll do questions of staff. Are there any uh, guests, councillors who have questions of staff? Seeing none, um, I will ask any uh, members around the virtual circle of committee members, do we have any questions of staff? No. Oh, there, there's one. Uh, Councillor Ainsley, you've got five minutes. All right. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Um, I guess the first question I wanted to ask staff, um, there's discussion in the report about uh, the City of Toronto leasing fiber infrastructure versus paying and building our own. I was wondering, have staff looked at the cost difference between the two? Um, through the chair, um, part of the process is that we want to come back in terms of the business case to submit. There has been preliminary look where we've looked at what we've leased versus what we want to build at. But the objective is to come back with a much more <clears throat> robust um robust information through the budget process okay and then um i also wanted to ask about um so part of the recommendation that is is outside isps would pay for excess um fiber to deliver internet directly to our to our residents so we would be leasing excess fiber they would be paying for excess fiber, is that correct? Through the chair, yes. The objective is that the excess fiber would be put out to the market in terms of um, opportunities for different solutions. Okay, and do, do we have any idea what that value would be or is that that's something you would look at including in the business case? Through the chair, that is something we've looked to include in the business case because the city is not prescribing the end solution, so it would be part of the business. Okay, and would there be conditions around, I guess, so leasing that excess fiber to an ISP, would there be conditions around that they would have to sell it to like our TCHC buildings, low-income residents, that would they have to offer like a, a low-income fiber package? Would that Pretty be one sure. of the conditions of that leasing? Yeah, through the chair, we would look at all various different con uh, conditions, and, and we are in conversations with Toronto Community Housing, with SDFA, so it would be part of the overall look at in terms of trying to focus on the underserved com uh, communities. So to summarize, all those conditions would be part of the um, proposal that we look at for the business case. Okay, and then Lawrence, I guess one of the one of the things, the majority of the definites have been from Acorn, and there seems to be a disconnect between Acorn and any of the telecommunication companies. And I'm trying to understand uh, what role that we have as a municipality to bridge that gap. Like we're the largest um, apartment owner in North America with TCHC, and we also have the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation. So I'm trying to understand within the business plan you're gonna be bringing back Will you be looking at a greater role of how we can advocate or bridge that gap between the telecommunication companies and, you know, uh, property advocacy groups like ACORN? Through the chair, yes, we do speak to the uh, private sector and, of course, with ACORN as well. And part of our community advisory group is continue to educate and inform. Uh, I just want to state very much so that... Um, the Connected Families Program, certainly, and there is eligibility, um, so there's specifics that you must be receiving the maximum Canada child benefit. Um, 
and the largest segment of low-income residents in Toronto would not qualify for that. So we will continue to use the Connectio program as a way of educating and inform in terms of what the voluntary programs that are being put forward by the private sector. It is our intent, it's a partnership, and we have relationships with ACON as well as the private sector. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Those are my questions, Deputy Mayor Minamon. Thanks, I believe uh, Councillor Pasternak, you had some questions? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So on page two, um, I think you're fairly clear that the city through this process is not going to be an ISP, uh, but on page eight, uh, there's sort of a different tone uh, where you're intimating that uh, the city could become uh, an ISP. And I think that's where the confusion is among the general public uh, and some media outlets that we were on the verge of offering a low discount uh, internet uh, service. Um, now, can, will the, uh, can the CRTC offer uh, a license to a municipality for the delivery of internet service? Is, is that done anywhere across the country and, and does it have the legal capacity to do so? Um, through the chair, um, I won't speak necessarily on the legality, but I will advise to the fact that it's actually called municipalities can operate what is called a non-dominant telecommunications carrier. And examples of municipalities that are doing that right now that can actually offer that is Calgary, the city of Surrey, and Yorknet in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. So it's called a non-dominant carrier, and the CRTC has a way you could apply into that for cities. Okay, regarding, uh, I guess it's on page nine, uh, we wanted to find some vendors who were willing to take this to the next step. Um, 45 vendors accessed the RFP documents and there were no submissions uh, received. Uh, does that mean that um, the private sector is really not interested in, in, in working with us or uh, we have to go it alone if we go further? Or maybe a bit of both? Um, through, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. Through the, through the Chair, um, even though there was no um, specific responses in terms of submission of bids. There was a lot of interest and we have received feedback. So in answering your question, there are providers and you've heard a couple today that are very keen to work with us. I would just like to state as well is that the, the, what we did was a pilot. It was focused on three locations, underserved locations. So it was very specific. The intent of that RFP was to gain feedback and so even though no one submitted the feedback we received through the lessons lunch was very helpful for the broader component of the business plan so i will just finalize by saying is that there are smaller providers there are medium providers that are very keen to walk in the city and you heard certainly a couple of them today so to understand uh what's before us is would it be the equivalent to um uh, the, the, we don't run, uh, governments don't run trucking companies, but we provide uh, major highways to move trucks around the country. Um, is that kind of the logic here that we would be uh, building infrastructure that independent, um, I guess, smaller uh, internet service providers would access and then pass on any savings to uh, to their customers? Is that is that really the logic uh, behind what's before us. Through the chair, that is the logic in terms of leveraging and unlocking the value. So that is exactly the logic of what we are proposing. So uh, last question, um, you start to talk about uh, digging once, which is, which is a nice thing because uh, multiple digs in the same spot is, is very frustrating for our local populations. Now, I, I can't speak for the whole city, but I can tell you they dug up uh, York Center um, across the, the public right of way um, a few years back uh, with with a, a flood of complaints about the way it was done. Aren't we already dug up uh, once and um, the the big uh, telcos um, have already um, have already been in there? Are we are we suggesting we go in there again and do our own? Um, through the chair, we are currently working with um, engineering and constructions in looking at future plans for future years. So as the 
city continues to build engineering pro uh, projects in the future, the aspect is to look at that dig once at that stage in terms of that process. The intention is certainly not to go and redig, but it's to look at a policy that sets the tone in the ability to look at future projects. And that's the conversations we're having with other divisions um, with an interest in this area. All right, just very quickly, uh, as part of that question, uh, my notes indicate that in 2015, the CRTC ordered the big telecom companies to share their networks. Um, is, is that something that um, has been enforced? Is that taking place where the, the Bells and the Rogers uh, are, are required under this ruling to share their networks with the, the smaller guys who are, who are offering lower rates? Any last question? Through the chair, I, I believe that that would be really a probably best place for the federal government through the CRTC to answer. I think that um, the incumbent status, as well as something called a CLEC, which is a competitive local exchange provider, the federal government, and through some of the advocacy that is occurring in city, is constantly trying to advocate for the fact to utilize infrastructure that drives competition. Um, but specifically in terms of the enforcement or the ability to measure if that specifically, I think that would be best place for the federal government to answer. We can certainly come back to you um, to, to provide that. But that would be my comments through the chair. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much. Councillor Thompson. Oh, yeah, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, um, as part of the information that's here in this report, you talked about conducting the uh, municipal broadband network phase one pre-tendering and there is uh, no uptake. What will be different with respect to where we are now and this sort of new updated report that you presented? Will we still require uh, that association with the uh, industry and how will things change in order to get them to be involved? So thank you very much through through the chair, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Um, the update is that it's focused on, um, which we always intended, was certainly looking internally. So the update of the changes of the recommendations was ensuring the centralization and the interconnection inside. So that's very important because that will essentially have a centralization of our assets to be able to determine what to leverage. So that's the first phase of where staff were focused on. Um, in parallel and certainly through conversations, um, we now will be able to, once we have that inventory in terms of the interconnection of our assets, be able to determine specifically across the broader city um, what specific areas that through a future uh, business case that the private sector could contribute in ensuring that they provide their solutions. So, this is really more of a phased approach, and it actually now looks at things more broadly uh, compared to the pilot initially that was looking at three locations. Got you. So when I hear you say phased approach, I'm wondering what will be the timeline to connect the final phase so that we actually get the end users who are the people who, from ACORN and others who have spoken to us this morning, what are we looking at from a perspective of timing? How long will this whole process take? When will they be able to have access to cheaper, more reliable internet uh, uh, service? Um, through the chair, thank you for the question. And, and to respond to that, we recognize that this issue in terms of what ACON and some of the community have spoken to have been years in the making. So our expectation is that um, we have done various initiatives of, uh, that have tried over the pandemic to try to work with our private sector to bridge the initial pressures. But in terms of a timelines, in terms of uh, from a competitive standpoint, from, from driving down the cost, I, I would say that we would need to sort of through the business case come back and, and answer that specifically. But it would certainly be at least a, a, a two to three year out um, from a high level estimation. But our hope through the business case is to come back uh, and be very more specific on that. But it's a complex item and it requires various uh, components we've heard today, but we're thinking in terms of our planning 
Um, and in terms of what we're speaking to the private sector, that it, it would still take a couple of years before we really see um, some of the, the feedback. But in the immediate terms, we will continue to advocate in terms of some of the private sector programs that have been stated. We'll continue to advocate in terms of some of the services that the city has collaborated with the private sector, some of our Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, and of course, we continue to work with the public for patients in trying to solve this, this issue where they can actually see it tangibly. But I would say it's still two to three years out. So if I right. could, so when I, sorry, uh, that's right. Deputy, Go ahead, please. Deputy Mayor Thompson Strokes, I just wanted to uh, just augment what Lawrence just said. I think it's important to also note our role and what we're putting forward here as recommendations is actually to also ask the provincial and the federal government to continue mm. investing into the urban and areas, and obviously rural areas too, and to leverage their assets if they have any too, no different than what we spoke about. And making sure internet is an essential service and affordable through policies and legislation. So that's another avenue that we have that we think is really critical and it's important. So I just want to add that, so thank you. Well, thank you very much because that was the very question I was going to ask. So you're reading my mind. So thank you very much for that. Those are the questions that I had, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. Anybody else? No. Um, well, then. Yes. I, I, yes. You no... can't oh. see me. Sorry. I, there you go. <laughs> sure, Bilo. Yep. Go ahead, yep. Just a few questions uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, do we have excessive fiber right now? Um, through the through the chair, we do have fiber um, right now, but it's not been interconnected. So the, the, the terminology of excessive, once we interconnect the fiber, we will have a lot more clarity based on what we've used internally and we continue to use and what is um, excessive. So the fact that the fiber is not interconnected is really where we're trying to leverage to give us a much more stronger clarity. But there is fiber all across the city that has opportunity. We just need to interconnect it. Okay, and are, um, I, I wanna follow up a bit on Councillor Pasternak's question. Are the big telcos that have the fiber, are they sharing that with uh, other uh, smaller providers or um, each other or, or no? There's like no connection whatsoever. Uh, through the chair, again, I, I would have to sort of defer for the telcos to speak on that, but um, I'm sure that there's various relationships or in certain areas that make economic interest based on their return in investments to determine whether they would share or whether they would not. Okay. And, but through your analysis, you, is, are there areas of the city right now that don't have the same access to this kind of fiber and therefore not as fast internet and so on and so forth? Through the chair, based on some of the research we did with the higher educational uh, institutions, uh, there are some areas within Toronto and the community where the speeds are not high enough to be able to ensure that people can utilize the uh, service in, in a full way at home. So there are, are, are areas that are just less in terms of speed, the, the speed sides to allow them to do various um, activities that they need in so conducting their life. It's definitely there in Toronto. So is the main goal of this initiative basically to take fiber and therefore the speed to those neighborhoods where the markets are not going at the moment or as fast as, as we would like? Is that it? It's not to overlap their work but compensate their work? Is that it? Through the chair, that is exactly it. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, it is to complement in those areas that are underserved where sometimes the uh, business cases of the private sector may not be as timely enough to reach those communities. Okay. And do we have any idea if we do this, um, what would be the impact on costs for those people or will we only see that uh, during the, when the business case comes up? Comes up? Through the chair, um, I would state it that we would try to present that through the business case uh, process. Okay, so you, you would have not only our capital costs that we will need, but also the impact that we'll have on the end user. You'll be able, able to have an idea on that. That's right, but through the chair, by working with those providers and some of their innovative solution, the modeling we're hoping is that they would be able to demonstrate some of that uh, affordability aspect. 
as well as also the sustainment of it. Uh, some of these programs, the key as well, we've heard from the public and also we've heard from various uh, groups is also keeping those prices sustainable from an affordability. So we're hoping through the innovation solutions that the private sector would come through, we would be able to demonstrate that through the business case as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Great. Um, anybody else on the committee? No? Uh, Councillor Pasternak, I have you uh, wanting to speak. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I do not have a motion. I just wanted to uh, share some views um, and listening to the deputants and certainly um, following following this issue, there's no doubt. Uh, I don't think anyone's in disagreement that having reliable, um, affordable internet into the home uh, is vital. Uh, it's vital for job search. It's vital for education, for entertainment, for shopping, uh, to be part of the uh, wider community. And its, um, and its role as a critical piece of infrastructure was particularly acute and apparent during the pandemic. And there's no doubt that as we watch uh, the economic indicators that uh, the cost of everything uh, just seems to be going up and is going up um, at the gas pumps, groceries, services, and of course, um, our telecommunications costs. It's important to realize that when um, internet service providers, the, the non, um, the non majors uh, provide lower, lower discounts. It's usually uh, in a case where um, the data packages are quite limited uh, and it's almost like subprime uh, mortgage. Um, if you want a data package that's really usable and versatile, uh, you'll see those costs creeping up to pretty well the market standard. And believe me, I've been through that uh, before. Across the city, um, I'm encouraged by aspects of this report uh, that we're continuing to expand our free internet service across our various uh, buildings. I think currently, we have about 100 libraries with free internet service. Uh, there's a plan to expand internet service to our 140 community centers. And I believe TCH buildings are also going to get um, internet service. I, I'm not sure why I have the, the figure of 152 in front of me. Uh, parks, uh, that's more on a model or, or um, experimental basis. Uh, and we do have 1,500 parks, but I doubt all 1,500 uh, will have internet service. So I think, I think we should be pledging ourselves to making internet availability through site plan applications, development applications in new buildings, whether they be purpose-built rental or condominiums, uh, that we negotiate hard for that uh, for those buildings to be serviced at a reasonable rate, below market rate of the internet. And we use our current assets, whether it be our civic buildings or our different our, our different um, uh, locations across the city, to provide free uh, internet. Um, at the same time, I think more work has to be done on the federal scene. Uh, there clearly, this is a federally regulated industry. Uh, can the, can a municipality actually be an ISP? My my feeling is that uh, no, it it cannot, um, and it comes with some high risks uh, when it does. At the same time, I think it's important to look back and see whether, uh, in fact, CRTC rules uh, forcing the big telecoms to share their networks uh, is actually happening and being enforced. Uh, that being said, I just want to thank staff in conclusion for um, for their work on this file. I'm not sure. My only my only concern uh, was what was in the public domain that we were on the verge of offering a low discount uh, internet service as an ISP, and that was never really never really the case. Uh, I use the analogy of the trucking industry, where we municipalities do not own trucking companies, although we have trucks. Uh, but uh, municipalities and pro the province and the federal government build the roads uh, to get the trucks around. And, and maybe that's something we have to look a little more closely here. The warning signs are, are there that uh, we've been unable to get a private sector partner uh, to work with us. Uh, so there's more work to do on this file, but I just want to thank staff for the report and the conversation and their initiative to expand free internet service across uh, our hundreds of uh, municipal locations. Thank you very much.
Well, uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, any other speakers? Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Uh, I want to start by thanking staff for all the work that they've done on this, reaching out to the community, discussing uh, the issues around Connect Heal with residents across Toronto. I think, you know, uh, it's very important. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around a municipal broadband network in Toronto. And, you know, on, on one hand, I'm glad that we're moving forward, we're moving away from what people think we're gonna build an all out municipal broadband network and looking more at connecting, using that municipal broadband network to connect our services. I think that's really important. If there's some way that we have access, uh, fiber uh, usage or width, broadband width, and we can you know lease that to an ISP and then they can have a program in place that will further help residents connect to to broadband in the city of Toronto, I think that's great. Because I think one of the things that we've heard today from almost all of the deputants that would be considered residents of the city of Toronto is affordability. You know, the one person said that when they had a choice between uh, buying their internet and food, they chose internet and at an expensive price. I think, you know, that's something we need to come to grips with in the city of Toronto. Um, but saying that, I also don't think we can uh, increase adoption in the city of Toronto by investing in technology, by building a redundant municipally owned fiber network. And I think staff have come to that realization. I think as a municipality, we really need to focus more on the social service aspects of the internet, understanding the factors that inhibit adoption and dealing with them on a case by case basis. And that's really clear in, in the motion that we had at the executive committee, where we talked about uh, factors other than prices, challenging the adoption of internet services in Toronto's priority neighborhoods. And I have five of those priority neighborhoods in my wards. Um, there's an availability of affordable internet programs in those areas from some of the major telecommunication companies. I think we need to work with you know, organizations like ACORN and find out why they're not, you know, why residents don't know more about them and what we can do to assist the major telecommunication companies in getting that information. As the largest shareholder in the city of Toronto through the Toronto Community Housing Corporation and the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation, which is about to um, become active, we need to find out how residents can get affordable internet and make sure they have the information because I think one of the things that we've heard loud and clear through COVID is that people need that access, whether they're going to school, um, trying to work, um, buying their groceries, communicating with their neighbors, they need that affordable internet. You know, um, training is another issue. You know, I sit on the board of directors of the Toronto Public Library where we talk about com computer literacy. How do we tackle fears about people having concerns about internet use? How people gain a better appreciation for the opportunities by home broadband connection? That's a key area of understanding for us as a municipal government. I think ultimately though, applying less technology and more social research is an area where the city of Toronto and its academic partners as Ryerson did an excellent report. Um, that's where we can provide real leadership in moving forward on internet affordability and in connectability. And um, so for those reasons, I'll be supporting uh, the report before us and uh, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, back to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, are there any uh, further speakers? No, okay. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna just briefly speak. I, I have, I'm moving the supplementary, um, the supplementary report. Um, Julie, do you want to uh, pop that up on the screen? It's okay. on the screen, Deputy Mayor. 
Yeah, I see it there. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Uh, look, this is a complicated file. Um, different people, uh, you know, approach it from different points of view, and I thought we had a good discussion on that. Um, I, I think that there are another number of questions that we have to answer. Um, is internet important? Yes. Um, what's affordable and who's providing it right now? I think we don't have, we haven't had like a, a we don't have all the information in front of us. Everyone is kind of suggesting, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But I, I, I'm actually quite surprised about some of the packages that some of the deputants were, were talking about. They seem fairly pricey. And then you go to some of the big providers and they say, you know, yeah, you're, it's only available for Toronto Community Housing. And then I look at a, a, a flyer and it says it's available for rank gear to income ODSP, Ontario Works, Guaranteed Income Supplement People. So, um, no info. I don't. I think it's unclear, uh, and yet to be properly discussed um, in a report. You know what's affordable and what's not affordable. I can tell you, there's a ten dollar a month program and a fifteen dollar a month program. You know, when you talk, even the fifteen. You know, the fifteen dollar a month program. That's fifty cents a day, right? um so um i think we have to discuss that um, i think the business plan is still a relevant discussion um what are we getting into we need to look before we leap um you know getting into dipping your toe on this doesn't mean you want to get sucked sucked right down to the bottom of the bottom of the pool um so i think that's important we haven't seen that yet and i think that um councillors ainsley, ainsley and thompson and myself were talking about that at the last meeting. Um, you know, and then we have to have the difficult discussion of, is this the job, is this something that the city should be doing? Like internet, in, the provision of internet is federal responsibility, right? And you have to ask yourself, the next question is, um, you know, should the city be doing this? Like we've got a lot of things on our plate that we haven't solved yet. We've got affordable housing, um we've got poverty we've got you know um uh we still have get the pandemic issues council you know the economics councillor thompson that you're seized with like that's not an easy file you have right and you know do we want to kind of put another big file on overlay that like should we be doing this in terms of um in terms of priorities i think that's an important question too and if you kind of want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit We've got, um, you know, a thousand plus employees working in the IT department. And I'm told like they're all engaged, right? So here we're gonna add another big file on top of that. Is that something we wanna do with all of us? I mean, Gary, you've got your budget. Councilor Ainsley, I know you've got your hands full over in your committee. Like here's another thing that we kind of have to figure out. Um, and then there's the proposition that, you know, I have concern about I mean, is the city going to say that it's going to be able to provide something better than the private sector? I mean, that's an interesting conversation to have. Like, we're not experts in this field. So I think that, they, that we have to kind of noodle through all these issues and have a, a really um, in-depth discussion. Um, I don't think we're, I, 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 quite frankly, I don't think we're um, at a decision point today. And that's why I'm moving the recommendations in the supplementary report. Uh, those are my remarks. I think we just have question. Oh, okay. Yeah, question? sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so you're deleting uh, recommendation one, which is to basically endorse the proposed creation of a city owned high speed municipal broadband network. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Julie, do you want to throw that up on the screen? The, throw the motion up on the screen, please. Yeah. Right. So if that's the case, um, do we then, are we then gutting this, um, this initiative? Now, I understand the point you made. No. And I just want to make sure it's clear. That's, that's all I'm asking, just for clarity. So we are proceeding with respect to two and the rest of the recommendation, but we're not essentially endorsing it at this time. So 
Counselor, I, I, I didn't write the report, but I think the I, I know was, that. But no, no, writing, no. But what I, yeah, what I want to say is this. Um, and you know, my belief is that you know those recommendations are not ready yet, and I'm expecting that. I'm not saying never do it, but I'm saying that those recommendations aren't ready for our approval today. No, no, I, I, I get that, but they're asking us to endorse so they can continue the work in order to get yeah. the information that you need. I'm just wondering, based on the uh, deletion of one, does do we I'm, and I'm just looking quickly at two, which is directing the uh, chief technology officer to do a variety of things to work with water and so on and, and to request the province to do certain things. But if we don't endorse it, how can we expect the province to then support the approach that staff we're then asking staff to take? It, it just doesn't sort of. I, I personally, I, I mean, I think that there were a number of other recommendations that that um, staff received with. Right. Uh, to, so, for example, coming forward with a business plan. Yep. Number one, number two, and as as you know, um, you know, it will this will likely come back in the next council, and so any motions or recommendations can be changed, you know, as early as January or February twenty twenty three, right? Right. But I just wanted to try to unpack this so that we're not saying don't look at this. We're just saying at this point it's not ready for our endorsement. Is that what that's you're right? Saying? Yes. Okay, fair enough. That, that's that's because we need more information. Like a complete package. Right. Look look, and, look before you leave. Right. Okay, fair enough. Oh, fair enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarity. Great. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Sure. Questions for the mover? Yeah. If you can put the, the motion back up on the screen. Um, um, Connecting city-owned facilities and assets, that sounds like um, low-hanging fruit because we're really on the way there anyway. We've already well started that, certainly through our library system. And council has endorsed the expansion of it in our community centers. Why, why are we pulling that one out? Um, do you want, if the, um, with the committee's indulgence, um, can we bring staff on the floor and they can describe why they why they suggested that recommendation? Uh, sure. Uh, if we want to vary the yeah, procedures if, if and, right. and bring staff, I'd be happy to do another round of questions for staff. Yep. Well, let's just have her, have them answer the question and then we'll see where this goes. Okay, Mr. Atta, did you? Uh, did you author the supplementary report? Hello, Deputy Mayor. We're getting. I'll lean to my nervous. Deputy Mayor. I'll lean to my colleague um, Alice, who can provide some of that feedback on the specific recommendation. Sure. Alice. Is she there? Or are we having trouble? She's coming on. She's just joining right now through the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies about that. Um, I uh, my internet dropped. <laughs> um, in regards to recommendations one and two being de deleted in the report, um, we, uh, as you've read in the report, we believe that the term uh, municipal broadband network uh, caused some confusion around the the goals of this work, um, and we wanted to make clear that you know the steps the city is taking are first interconnecting our assets. So that is um, essentially part of what recommendation two has uh, directed us to do, 
we do also have a previous directions from council um, in both um, optimizing city assets uh, from a well-run city perspective, as well as uh, making sure that uh, we provide secure um, and available uh, connectivity through a centralization exercise. So we felt that recommendation two was redundant to previous um, to previous directions that uh, the city council has given us. And so to, to make it very, very clear about uh, what the goals of this particular report uh, is, is moving forward with, we, um, we recommended in the report that recommendations one and two be removed so that um, we have the opportunity to move forward with interconnecting our assets to bring that as uh, asset uh, to life, uh, as well as being able to come back with a report on how to leverage excess conduit and uh, connectivity for uh, broader public benefit. Mr. Pasternak, did you have another question? No, I think that I think that is assuring that that we're not going to go backwards. Um, on, on that issue of connecting our city owned assets and buildings and facilities, um, libraries, community centers. So I think that's sufficient. Okay. Um, did anyone else have questions on the motion? Members of the committee? No? All right. Um, thank you, Al, Al Misu. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, are we ready for a vote then? All right. Um, so we'll take the um, my motion. All those in favor? Recorded vote, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, for the mayor's sake. Oh, that's thank you. That's a good, that's a good um, good catch. All those in favor? So this is a recorded vote on um, the amendment. All in those in favor, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Bylow, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor Pasternak. That carries unanimously. Thanks very much. Is there an, an so we'll take the rest of it now, Julie? Yes, so I'll do a recorded vote on adopting Clauses the amend item as amended. Um, item is amended. All in favor. Deputy Mayor Min Wong, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Bailao, Councillor McKelvey, and Councillor Pasternak. The item is amended, carries unanimously. Excellent. Thank you, members. Um, we're going to go. Uh, Julie, can you let the mayor know that we're finished with um, the item he has a conflict with and we can move on to EX 32.2? To the Deputy Mayor, I will let him know that he can return to the chamber. Okay, uh, 32.2, Implementing Tenants for Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation. Um, I believe we have uh, one deputy, Mr. Bill Lohman. Mr. To the, um, to the Mr. chair, Clark, one moment, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Many thanks uh, to the um, deputy chair for, as always, chairing so ably and getting through that important item that I unfortunately had to absent myself from. Uh, we, we then moving along through the agenda. Could I just get a sort of straw poll on your wishes, by the way? Because I think while we have a number of items, Julie's just pr pr producing the sort of remaining list of things we did not deal with, but we have a limited number of deputations and items that I don't think are going to uh, cause a uh, long discussion, but I wanted to know if it was your preference to take the uh, normal uh, time at lunch or to keep uh, going through the agenda and uh, have a motion at the appropriate time or now to uh, have us extend to finish, which I, I'm, I'm totally in your hands. I, I've allocated the whole day for this, so. What would your preference be? Let's, let's keep going, Mr. Mayor. Let's keep going. That, that, that is what I would prefer to do, but I, I just didn't want if people had made arrangements to have meetings. You, you, you can't do that? Okay. Pardon me? Uh, sorry, Mayor Tori. It's yes. Councillor Ainsley. I have a, I'm here by video, but I have another video meeting at Okay, well, there's now three people that have told me that, so we'll, we'll have to, we'll take, the prop, we'll take the usual break at lunchtime then for an hour, and we'll resume at 1.30. All right, let's, let's uh, go then. Uh, item 32.2, implementing tenants first. Uh, and there is one uh, deputant on that, so we'll hear from him first. Uh, is Mr. Bill Lohman on the line? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Lohman, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for being with us. And uh, you know the rules, I think. we ha You have five minutes, and there may be some questions for you. And welcome to the Executive Committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Executive Committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to address this body today. My name is Bill Lohman, and I'm a senior living in the soon-to-be Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation. I represent the Saranac Seniors community, and I am a member of the stack. City Council deserves a big thank you for its insight passing the members motion 38.51 to reassert the voice and importance of the stack to ensure the voice of tenants are heard and reflected in the policies and procedures of the new seniors corporation. A senior's perspective provides context for tenant concerns and offers a foothold to correcting the collaboration and balance of the integrated models missing senior tenant involvement. And this is something the stack was designed to address. The result of council's directive and with the direct involvement of the deputy city manager to chair the meetings, the stack is working to um, refine its role and its mission going forward. And we are seeing good signs of increased consultations with staff and professional support to define the principles and method for senior engagement. A stack working group is assisting the Health Commons Wellness Initiative with their round table and coffee chats to engage senior tenants about health, wellness, and well being. And the Quality Tenant Engagement Committee from the Seniors Board is helping guide the hard work of stack, senior housing, and city staff in a collaborative effort to find the common ground to define and align positive engagement principles that are agreeable to all. And there's been much hard work and a whole lot of effort to get uh, to this new beginning for seniors and a world of new possibilities. We have a new CEO to spearhead the effort of developing a pathway to a senior centric model that addresses the needs and priorities of seniors in an environment where communities are greeted with a positive can do spirit to ensure that the foundation that we're laying down now will be resilient and reflective of our mutual need and expectations. On June 1, the doors to the new Toronto Senior Housing Corporation will open and it will realize the hard work and effort of many. And it is the first official day for the senior's new CEO, Tom Hunter. I'm excited about the possibilities and the potential for the new corporation to be a trendsetter for inspiration and quality senior housing. We are on the doorstep of a momentous achievement and the beginning of possibilities. And this is an opportunity for council to begin rethinking the values and expectations that built the integrated service model for the staffing, structure, supports, et cetera, and to consider the current needs and the future of aging seniors that require a different set of values and assumptions to achieve a living in place dignity that reflects the vast range of physical challenges between ages 60 and 100 and recognizes the psychosocial realities of declining health and limited options that are faced by marginalized and low income seniors as they age in place. So with that, thank you very much for your time and your consideration today. Well, I thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, Mr. Lohman, and taking the trouble to come and speak with us today. Are there any questions of this deputy? Uh, Mayor Torres, Councillor Ainsley. Yes, uh, Councillor Ainsley, please go ahead. Um, I don't so much have a I don't so much have a question as I just want to thank Mr. Lohman. He did appear at our. I sit on the board of directors of the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation. He was uh, made a deputation at our last board meeting, and I just wanted to thank him for his input and his care and his interest in seeing the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation succeed. Thank you very much, Councillor Ainsley. I second those words too. Thank you, Mr. Lohman. Others uh, wishing to speak or ask questions of the deputy, to, to ask questions of the deputy, rather. Okay, well again, Mr. Lohman, many thanks for all of your contributions and I hope you keep interested in this and keep in touch with us as we uh, evolve this and implement this because it's important to know uh, the kind of feedback that you offered today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Have a that, nice day, folks. You too. That would bring us to questions of staff. Are there uh, members of the uh, committee that have questions of staff? 
I see none on the screen or here in person, then we can go to speakers. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just want to uh, thank staff for a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, it's, it's not um, easy to uh, separate these two uh, organizations, or what it will be two organizations. And so there's been a lot of work. Uh, your leadership as well, uh, because this is part of uh, the work that was done on Tenants First. This was one of the recommendations, and here we are ensuring that we have um, a strong, solid Toronto community housing and a strong and solid uh, Toronto Seniors Corporations. And I think we have a great opportunity um, to really innovate and provide excellent service uh, for seniors in our city. We know that we have an aging population in here. We know that we need to start finding new ways to serving our seniors uh, outside just the long-term care homes or assisted living that sometimes uh, services like this that are, are going to be more innovative, that are going to have services and supports in some way coming to where the, re the residents are living so they can be more independent is going to be crucial for the future. So I think uh, the City of Toronto could be at the forefront of developing some of these services, some of these models, and I think that's what we're doing here. And we're putting seniors first and so I once again want to thank staff for all their hard work uh, the board of the seniors uh, corporation that was recently uh, put together Councillor Ainsley and Councillor Fletcher are, are there as well and you're like I said before your leadership on this because this is the is part of the work of tenants first that we're checking one by one and here we are I'm very pleased to see this report coming forward so thank you thanks Deputy Mayor Barlow others uh, wishing to speak I'm just looking at the screen uh, Councillor Ainsley uh, thank you, Mayor Tory. Um, I'm, I'm, as was mentioned earlier, I'm on the board of directors of the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation. Uh, a lot of heavy lifting has been done to see this corporation come to reality on June 1st. I want to thank by start by thanking Mayor Tory uh, and the work that was done in Tenants First. Uh, I can think back to when I was a kid. For example, we had a building at uh, Lawrence and Kingston Road. It was a seniors only building. It was with the old Metropolitan Toronto Housing Corporation. And post amalgamation, uh, it was removed as a seniors only building into the building it is today. And uh, I heard a lot of concerns when I was elected uh, about you know the, the need for better seniors housing and services in our TCHC buildings. And with the creation of the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation, uh, we have 83 buildings that we're gonna be looking after across the city of Toronto. Um, I think that vision has come to fruition and the needs of our seniors housing, uh, seniors tenants are gonna go along to being met, need and addressed. So uh, I, at this point, I would like to overall thank the board of directors for all the work that they've done the staff that we've hired to date at the Toronto Seniors Housing Corporation, uh, the board of directors, the chair, our uh, C interim CEO. We have a, a new CEO coming in shortly. Uh, I want to thank city manager Chris Murray for his work and guidance, deputy, deputy city manager Paul Johnson, uh, both who've been at our board meetings, and uh, I'm looking forward to some ribbon cuttings. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Ainsley. Others uh, wishing to speak? Just looking at the screen, seeing none, seeing no one here. Uh, then I'll just say a few words if I might. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to just underline something that Deputy Mayor Bilo made reference to, which is how important uh, a, a juncture this is. Um, if you go back, uh, and you know, people often in government uh, reports get written and they take a while to write because they have to be thoughtfully done, but then you sort of have trouble figuring out, well, what happened to the things that were suggested in the report? And if you go back to what the genesis was and the purpose and the mission of the Tenants First report, it was to find a new way to make sure that we could take better care of people in the end, the people that, that we were entrusted with uh, providing uh, shelter and support to. And if you just look at two or three of the recommendations, I just want to take note, because it's an important time to do this, uh, of, of, of two or three things that were really integral, important elements of that report that actually have been implemented. I'll start with the money, because in the end, uh, you know, the money is what provides for all the things that we have to do. And this council, 
uh, under this administration, coming out of the report of the Tenants First uh, examination by Senator Eggleton, and I should thank him again for all the work he and his team put into that. Uh, this council approved multi-year funding for the first time ever for Toronto Community Housing. So they know both on an operating and on a capital basis, they can rely on the financial support of this city administration to uh, do their work. And it allows them to plan and run themselves in a more, more business-like way. Second, uh, and these are many, and the list are many a number of things you could cite, but the second was the, uh, the, the what I call the decentralized, more grassroots administration of the company itself, particularly as it regards uh, the needs of the tenants and making sure the buildings and other things are, uh, are satisfactory places for them to live. And that has been implemented. And that was an, a real wholesale reorganization of uh, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation. And the third, which is hugely significant, probably right up there with the money, was the creation of a separate seniors housing uh, corporation. And of course, we wanted it to be done not in a way that said, well, let's just duplicate all of the uh, administration and expense and, and everything else of the TCHC, but rather that we would create something that was kind of lean, but that was able to look at this new way of trying to care for the seniors who were in our, uh, in our uh, uh, seniors housing buildings, 83 buildings, thousands of people, uh, within the context of saying that they need wraparound care, that they need the kinds of uh, supports that older people need to have, uh, and that we could provide that in kind of an integrated way for the first time better done uh, through the auspices of a separate uh, corporation than uh, within the, uh, the, the very broad mandate of TCHC itself. And that work has been done, and I want to take this moment to pay tribute to Michael Scherrer, who has been uh, the interim CEO as referred to, I think he was called the transition lead, but in effect he was in charge. He has done an excellent job. Um, he has led a team of people to get us this far, and, and this is a very important uh, jumping off point, as I said, and to prepare the way for the new CEO, uh, Tom Hunter, who has been carefully selected by the board. But I want to thank Michael very much for his work. I think as evidence of how highly he's held in regard by uh, people generally across uh, you know, all parts of the spectrum, uh, he's taking over a new job uh, very soon as president and CEO of Public Health Ontario. And this is a very big responsibility, especially in uh, post-pandemic uh, times. And we're not quite at post-pandemic yet, but we're getting there, I hope. But I just, you know, in, I see that as an indication of how lucky we were to have him in this kind of interim uh, chapter to do this very important work. And I thank him, and I think he's laid groundwork uh, very well for um, the permanent CEO, Tom Hunter, to come in and take the reins very shortly. Uh, Michael will uh, be with Tom in a transitional period for a little while, which also always helps to have the person help that helped put the transitional plans together. So I have very high aspirations for this corporation, I should say, because I know a couple of people raised in some of the preparation for this meeting, whether the $4 million that's being approved today is kind of new money and will end up precisely where I said we didn't want to end up, which is having a duplicate administration and so on. In fact, the way it was done, not knowing exactly when this corporation would take over responsibility for its own affairs, is that there was money allocated in the TCHC budget for this year to take account of the people that would uh, have the responsibility for the seniors' housing uh, corporation administration, and that money is now being transferred um, to the corporation itself, so that I think by the time you see next year's budget, uh, you'll find that uh, we've achieved what we want, which is a corporation dedicated to looking after, in the best way possible, our senior residents uh, that are in the responsibility of, of, of uh, community housing in the city uh, through the Seniors Housing Corporation, but at uh, very little added expense to the taxpayers or to the people. Um, well, you taxpayers, they pay the bills for all of this. Uh, and done in an, in an efficient and effective way. So again, my thanks to uh, all those who are mentioned by the Deputy Mayor and by Councillor Ainsley, including Councillor Ainsley and Councillor Fletcher who are on the board, but also to the City staff, uh, City Manager Chris Murray, City Deputy Manager Paul Johnson, and all the others involved, including the staff and Board of Directors of uh, Toronto Community Housing. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we're then ready to uh, have uh, someone move the recommendations contained in the report for item 32.2, tenants first. Um, and I think I see Deputy Mayor Bailao wanting to do that. And I will then call the question. All those in favor, opposed? Can we have a recorded vote, please? A recorded vote, for sure. Can we have a recorded vote, please, Julie? Uh, this is a recorded vote on EX 32.2. All in favor? Mayor Tory, Deputy Mayor Minim Wong, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Crawford, uh, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor Pasternak, that carries unanimously. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, we have time to start and maybe finish, depending on the level of discussion and debate, uh, the uh, Harbor Lead Line and the Keating Rail Yard. But we do have a speaker uh, on that. And the speaker is uh, Paul Scribner from TIN. Uh, is Mr. Scribner on the line? OK. He's just coming up. Hi, Paul. This is the host. You are currently unmuted. A good, good day, Mr. Okay. Scribner. Are you there? Can you hear me? We can. You're most welcome here at the Executive Committee. As you know, you have five minutes, and there may be some questions. So please go yes. ahead. Well, thank you, Mayor Tory, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I wanted to be uh, there in person today, but uh, there was a stoppage on the subway this morning, so that. Uh, uh, made me change my plans, and I regret that. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to give a special thanks to the Waterfront Secretariat and working with TIN uh, this past month on the rail issue, and uh, we appreciate that and also look forward to working with the Secretariat on an ongoing basis with um, the new um, uh, port uh, working group that had its first meeting last month. Um, I think we should uh, take a look at not only what the port and uh, its needs are today, but also um, have some vision and take a look at what its needs are going to be 20 years from now. And to that end, um, in our letter, we made uh, we have three asks that are bundled together. And the first is that uh, council direct staff to bank the harbor lead right away uh, per the recommendations of a Dillon report that was done for the Waterfront Secretariat last December. And this includes a new rail yard at Unwin Avenue uh, and uh, changing uh, the easement on curves uh, to allow for uh, longer uh, rail cars to be used. And this is very important. And secondly, we ask that the city write the province to have Metrolinx donate its portion of the rail right of way, 300 meters, to the city. Um, and uh, it doesn't need that uh, 300 meters, but it's essential if you want to restore a rail service at some time in the future. And thirdly, uh, that a new rail right of way be uh, dedicated running westerly from Leslie Street uh, to the Lafarge facility at Polson Street. And it's a, uh, that's a very large facility. It's very important for Lafarge here in the region, and Lafarge has written to that effect. Uh, Lafarge and uh, two other uh, companies are TIN members uh, and are, have operations in the port. Now, uh, why do we ask this? Because this is public land, so it, it should just sit there. Well, that's not the case. Um, we're very concerned that this land we built on, and that would uh, sterilize further the, the right of way. And a classic example of that uh, today is a Canada Post facility on Leslie Street and the Lookout Park that's being uh, uh, is supposed to be constructed uh, beside it. And both of those are right on top of the, uh, the uh, port uh, rail line. Uh, the port serves primarily Toronto and the immediate region today. Uh, but if rail is taken away, that removes the option for it to expand its reach and broaden its business base. And uh, this would be too bad. If you look at other Great Lakes ports, most of them, uh, they all have rail service, which is actively used. And uh, I point out that shipping on the Great Lakes is increasing exponentially. Uh, and uh, this seems to be the way of the future. It's a well-established trend. Um, before the rail service stopped to the port, Ports Toronto, it was handling about 200 cars a day. Uh, it was stopped because uh, the track became in such a bad state of repair that CN embargoed it. They refused to run their trains on it anymore. The uh, future of the Keating Yard, which is uh, part of the uh, staff report today, well, that's a mute point because it was ripped up a, a couple of months ago um, without council approval. And it's my understanding, I just learned this, that uh, TEDCO actually owns the, uh, the rail right of way, uh, right from where Metrolinx uh, st uh, stops and it goes all the way to where uh, Ports Toronto is. And um, 
There is a agreement that uh, apparently exists, a tripartite agreement, which is a result of a legal settlement established in 2002, which guaranteed that the rail line be intact for 30 years, unless Port Toronto wanted to give it up. And uh, my final comment is that the supplementary staff report on page five says that Ports Toronto uh, has not written the city to that uh, regarding that. And I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Paul, Mr. Scribner. And uh, uh, I will have a couple of questions that will be asked uh, of staff as appropriate uh, about some of the things you raised. Uh, so uh, we, we, we will perhaps hear more about that as uh, we go on through dealing with this item. Are there any questions of this deputant? I, I might, if there aren't any, I might just ask one, which is that uh, I certainly have it in the report. So I, I'm not saying I have it sort of via some uh, sort of uh, third-hand account. Uh, in the report, it uh, talks about Ports Toronto has confirmed that the competitive advantage of Ports, the Port of Toronto does not depend on rail access. Ports Toronto relies on truck and marine access uh, as the port's proximity to downtown Toronto enables the efficient servicing of local supply chains. Uh, noting the significant capital expenditures that would be required to restore the harbour lead line to operational status as well as ongoing operational costs, Ports Toronto has indicated there is no business case for the line and it is of the view that public funds would be better spent on improvements to the Portland's transportation network. Did you have any comment just on those words? Because that, that's what I, just what we read. I mean, that was what was given to us. Yes, Mayor. Yeah, Mayor Tory, I read the same thing. And a comment is this, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we're looking at everything today, and that's that's easy to do. But what we have to do is say, so what about the future? And uh, yeah, there may not be a case today for uh, keeping uh, the rail line. There is a cost to reestablish it. I think we should go through that with a, a very sharp pencil. Uh, for instance, just putting the un unwind line portion of the line back is only a million dollars a mile, and that's a pretty standard cost in the rail business. And furthermore, the federal government has uh, funding uh, which can be extracted uh, to increase the capacity of ports through new infrastructure. And so putting the rail line back, uh, replacing, repairing existing dock walls, which are more than 100 years old to increase capacity, are all things that the city should be doing. And I think Tim could be uh, quite supportive in that. Um, and I point to, uh, uh, Pearson, which has received a funding, considerable government funding uh, on that basis to increase capacity. But there is a program now for ports. The Americans are doing the same thing. They're spending 76 million this year on increasing capacity on only six Great Lakes ports. And that's a program that's been going for two years. So uh, I just point that out. Uh, I hear what you're saying, but our cup is half full here and it's preserving our, an easement we're not suggesting at all that there be huge amounts of money put in at this point. It's just to preserve this for the future. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scrivener. Any other questions of this deputy? Okay, seeing none, I will thank you very much for your uh, representation and appreciate your interest in these things as you, as always, with you. Thanks so much and your members. Thank them. Okay, questions of staff. Uh, okay, well, if there's no one else, uh, may I just ask, is there somebody here, uh, I guess it would be, uh, is it you, Josie, that's here to deal with this, or uh, no? Sorry, I can't hear. Okay, uh, I, I just don't know who's here with us. Uh, is it Tracy? I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Uh, I just uh, the matter of Ports Toronto has come up from Mr. Scribner, and it's come up, uh, I think, even internally inside the City Hall and the matter of this contract. Um, and uh, I don't have in my book here, uh, I know there's a confidential attachment and it may have the answer to my question which couldn't be given in public anyway. But I just wanted to check because the narrative that I just read from uh, says that Port Toronto is, would be content with this decision. But the suggestion has been made both by Mr. Scribner kind of indirectly and also by others that they may not be content but with this or they weren't adequately consulted or whatever. And they're not here deputing today, so I would have thought if they weren't happy, we'd hear from them. But could you just help us with that? Uh, certainly. So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, there is a confidential attachment uh, that's brief in this regard. Uh, what I will say is we have had correspondence from Ports Toronto and discussions while... 
I've just lost your sound there for a second. Uh, how, how am I now? There, I'll you're try fine to stay now. Close. Thank you. Yep, you're, you're back. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I don't want to zoom in too much. This is a lot of me to see on a small screen. <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about uh, the use of the rail as it relates to the ports. There are other matters that Ports Toronto does have an interest in uh, that's, uh, that's related to this matter, but is not specific about the replacement of the rail. Uh, and I think we do make reference to conversations in respect to the rebuilding of Unwin and some other items that they would like us to speak with them about. Uh, so we do have in writing that they have not, and in conversation, that they're not um, advancing the use of rail uh, as it relates to the port's operations, but they do uh, have interest in the ability of, for transportation uses, trucks, et cetera, to be uh, accessible. So we're continuing those discussions uh, in that regard with Ports Toronto. I think I can ask this question in public, uh, which is, um, can, can I ask you if they are satisfied from the standpoint of a legal, uh, from, from a legal standpoint with regard to the provisions of this contract that we're either discussing or, but the, 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 we're not likely to see some kind of an action that they're satisfied enough that we've either dealt with things to their satisfaction or we are in discussion with them such that uh, we are going to uh, be in compliance with uh, our contractual requirements? Uh, to that end, Mr. Mayor, I would suggest that that reflects the confidential attachment in a discussion that's best held in camera if necessary. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I wouldn't want to speak for Ports Toronto. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I understand that too, of course. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think I want to do that at this juncture uh, to go in camera on this uh, <laughs> because I think if they had something to say that was, uh, you know, for the digestion of the executive committee, they'd be here. Um, you know, and, I, and they're not here. So I, I don't mean to sort of attribute anything in particular to their attendance or lack thereof, but I would think if they had some things to say, even things that were not, uh, you know, uh, uh, confidential from a legal standpoint, they'd be here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, if I could say, Mr. Mayor, I, I think if we look at the recommendations and what we're requesting of committee and council to approve is for us to continue whatever necessary conversations need to happen, uh, but yes. the principle of the, the of not maintaining the rail line at this particular time is uh, is what we're recommending and then we'll continue whatever necessary conversations there are to give rise to that okay so uh, i don't have any more questions uh and i don't really have anything to say uh, about the matter i just wanted to ask those questions is there anyone else who wants to speak there wasn't anybody earlier for questions anybody wants to speak i do have uh, if, if not then i have uh, to speak only just to to um, move this motion which is that the executive committee adopt the recommendation in the supplementary report from the deputy city manager infrastructure and development services uh, which is one city council direct the confidential attachment one remain confidential in its entirety as it is about potential litigation and contains advice which is subject to solicitor client privilege and uh, the, i would be happy to move that motion uh, and uh, call the question on that and then on the item as amended if there's no one else Seeing no one, I'll, I'll ask for, uh, first of all, call the question on the motion that I just moved to do with the confidential attachment one. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And on the item as amended, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. It is 27 minutes past 12, and so let me just see what is coming up next so we can see what we're starting on after lunch. I don't think there's any questions. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yes. It's Councillor Cropper. I'm just wondering if there'd be a possibility of doing a quick release on EX 32.12. You've held it. That's the exclusive food and beverage service agreement. I did have a couple Yes, I, I only to held that down so because you had filed that motion and uh, the motion is, is fairly straightforward because I knew of it. Uh, and I hope people have had a chance to look at it. I don't think anybody has a problem. May I uh, then uh, ask that, um, where are we here? I had that motion right here. Here it is. No, that's not it. Oh, it's on the screen. There we go. Uh, so the, the, the city council amend the terms and conditions in confidential attachment one to the report from the chief executive officer exhibition place as set out in the confidential attachment to this motion. Uh, and I think uh, you've had a chance to take a look at that. So I'll call the question on that. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And on the item as amended, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. So that does take care of that. Good use of time there, Councillor Crawford. It's 12.30 on the dot. We'll resume at 1.30. With thanks to everybody.
to the chair if you can give us a five second countdown and begin from there. Thank you. Okay, this meeting is resumed uh, and where we left off, uh, we were, the next item for us to consider is item EX 32.6, Intergovernmental Partnerships and Advocacy Efforts to Advance the City's Housing TO 2020-2030 Action Plan. Um, of course, we have the report itself, which is here in front of us, uh, but we also have the, the um, communication that I put on the record this morning, which I wanted to draw attention to, and I will at the appropriate time, uh, uh, draw attention to it in, in speaking. But uh, before that, uh, there are no deputations on this, so I will ask, first of all, if there's any questions of staff. I don't know if uh, Deputy Mayor Bylaw might have, if she had been here, uh, had some questions of staff. But uh, do we know, does anybody have an idea when she might be joining? Okay, she knew, I know she did have something uh, over the... Uh... Okay. Uh, any questions of staff by any members of the committee? Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Tory. Um, you know, it's, it's great to see the $27 uh, million from the provincial government and the acknowledgement uh, that there's going to be further increases to that. I, I was um, curious about the Housing Now sites. We've had federal dollars flowing for our rapid housing, modular housing, hotel conversions. So there's three Housing Now sites. Uh, there's one at Wilson, Warden, and Victoria Park. I was I was curious where those commitments are, if there's been any discussion with the federal government or any response. So I see Abby Bond is with us, and uh, who, by the way, I should say, is just doing an excellent job for us with, uh, I don't know how many hours of the day you put in, but it must be about 28. So I thank you very much for that, and perhaps you could uh, address Councillor Ainsley's question. <clears throat> Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we are working very closely with CMHC, our colleagues um, at the federal government who kind of lead the housing file. We have um, regular meetings with them, both about partner projects, but also specifically about the Housing Now sites um, and uh, working with them to try and uh, secure the financing and funding necessary to move those sites forward quickly. Obviously, it's a partnership with the uh, proponents, the people who have bid on those sites. Um, but yes, it's very much a priority um, in our discussions with CMHC right now. Okay, and sorry, when did, sorry, Abby, when did we send those requests to us, CMHC or Ottawa? Like, how long have we been waiting? Um, so, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the requests come in a number of different ways. So, the proponents themselves directly request uh, financing from CMHC. So, the applications for all of those sites have gone in at various times. Um, and then they, CMHC will go through, um, a review and underwriting process to determine the financing amount and then it, with respect to um, broad like additional funding so grant funding or um, other types of funding these are requests that we really have on an ongoing basis so it's not just a formal letter that we've sent they're part of discussions that we're having with CMHC almost on a weekly basis. Okay do you have any expectation of when we might see funding for them or have have they given any indication? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I couldn't comment on CMHC's kind of review process, but um, uh, we've been very uh, pleased, I think, with their interest in housing now. They would seem to be recognised the importance of sites where municipalities like us are putting their land forward to drive affordability, and they have seemed very interested in that. So um, I remain optimistic that they'll see the, the gains on the benefits in investing adequately in these sites. Okay, and just my last question, Abby. So while we wait for the money or we're waiting for some indication of when it's going to come from CHC, is is that keeping these projects from being, you know, lack of a better word, shovel, shovel ready or shovel in the ground? Is that causing much delay or...? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, we are hoping that at least uh, two, if not three, of the sites that you mentioned could be moving forward towards um, construction later this year so we're kind of continuing to push on that it's important for us to see um, progress on these sites quickly as many people waiting for affordable housing um, so we'll continue to push on that in terms of the timing 
Okay, great. Thanks, Abby. Appreciate the questions. Uh, Mayor Tory, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Ainsley. Others uh, wishing to ask questions? I uh, don't see anybody else on the screen. don't see anybody else here. I just have a couple that really follow along what Councillor Ainsley was, uh, was asking, uh, Abby, and that is, uh, first of all, uh, let's start with the um, uh, supportive housing. Um, am I right to say that uh, some of the targets that are set out here for uh, the years going forward um, are things that actually we, have, we would have good reason to be optimistic that uh, the funding, say, of the phase three of the rapid housing uh, program, which has been uh, confirmed, I guess, in the agreement reached between the parties in Ottawa, that some of that would come our way and will help us uh, with respect to uh, the, I'll call it the capital side of, of those projects? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, we're, um, we were very pleased with our kind of first 24 month plan that we we're able to secure the capital uh, funding through the first two phases of the rapid housing initiative from the federal government. And we feel that is this kind of plan and kind of forward looking plan that helps us secure uh, capital funding. So we are awaiting, like everybody else, um, further news of the timing of that and the amount of money that will be available directly to municipalities. And it's, it would be our intent to move quickly in a timely way to apply for that money for this, um, this next 24 month plan. And then uh, flipping to one that's a little more, uh, you know, challenging for us, and it was this was something that Councillor Ainsley did ask you about, and I wanted to ask you about it in a slightly different way, which was, if you looked uh, right now at uh, what stands between us and and having those proverbial shovels in the ground that Councillor Ainsley asked about for the three sites that you specifically mentioned, would would the CMHC financing issue, um, you know, which everybody's trying to sort of, would that be the issue that is uh, that is in the way, and is, is everything else pretty much resolved? Um, I understand there, there may be a, um, a number of um, uh, other um, kind of construction related matters that needed to be attended to, but in the main I would say that the funding of these uh, three sites from both the financing and also the grant funding which we think that is needed to move forward is one of the main kind of obstacles at this point, yes. All right, well, let me put it another way to you, which is to say then, if uh, you could sort out the financing issue with CMHC, and let's just confine it for the moment to those three sites that are so far advanced, uh, Victoria Park, Warden, and Wilson uh, Heights, or Wilson, uh, w are you pretty optimistic those other issues you made reference to, construction-related issues, could be resolved fairly quickly and we could be under construction with those affordable housing units? Um, yes, Mr. Matt, that's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, that's those are the, all, the only questions I had. Now we we did have questions of staff here, and didn't the deputy mayor Bilo is now here? Do you have any questions of staff on this report? Just one last one to follow on on your questions on the housing. Now, um, would I be correct to say that if we don't get the um, the funding from the federal government, the way that the the amount of affordable housing in these on these sites is at risk? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the Deputy Mayor, um, the funding package for these sites is critical to um, delivering on the affordable housing promises that have been made on these sites and the expectations that we have. But I would say that the funding is in two categories. It's both financing uh, and grant or equity funding. And many of these projects have significant amounts of equity already in them, including equity from the proponents and also the city land. What we're hoping to see is a solid financing package, but also uh, grant funding from the other two levels of government to support the action uh, on the Housing Now sites. And, and two more questions. Can you remind us again out, out of the, I don't know if this question has been asked, but just in case it wasn't, out of the 24 billion dollars of our housing now plan how much has each level of government contributed up to date um through you mr mayor um i would from the provincial government side i would have to recalculate that based on the uh, funding that we have received this morning um but it was about uh, 0.6 a uh, billion from the provincial government and about 2.5 billion from the federal government and, from and the, the city, city ourselves we've we've committed over $7 billion thus far. So we're clearly leading the way in terms of investments on housing right now, but we're uh, continuing to demonstrate the importance of an all government approach um, so that we can fully fund our housing TO plan. 
And uh, how many projects do we have in the go right now with affordable housing and how many units under planning and development? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we have around 109 projects uh, which are in various stages of approval and construction. Um, and that's about, uh, if I remember, it's about 17,000 uh, affordable homes. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Bond. Um, so if there are no other questions of staff, then we can move to speakers uh, and who wishes to speak on this matter. I have a motion and I will have to speak in due course, but I certainly want to give the chance to uh, Deputy Mayor Bylaw first. Go ahead, I, please. I can speak and Mayor, I can, I want to start by thanking you for your efforts that came to fruition last uh, night, I guess, with, uh, with the good news that we have the money for the supportive housing. Uh, we all, when we started uh, this plan to have the 3,000 uh, people housed uh, over, the, over the two years, 2021 and 2022, we knew that we needed the three orders of government. That's why we put in our share of land, tax incentives, some funds. The rapid housing program was essential to create some of these units. Um, and we have been advocating hard and no one more than you and your office uh, on these funds. And so um, it is great to see them come in. Uh, I'm sure that we're gonna continue the conversation because I think this has to be a strategy that needs to be continued. We need to stop having a shelter system that acts as the facto house and really truly invest in supportive housing. But that supportive housing can only exist if we have the three orders of government together. So. Again, thank you for all your efforts and, and um, congratulations. I think it's very, it's very, very successful. Uh, as I mentioned already, the Rapid House program has also been something that we had been advocating, um, you know, not only uh, through our work, but through, our, through uh, uh, FCM. Uh, this has been a program that as soon as the pandemic hit, we worked hard to have the Rapid Housing uh, Initiative. Uh, and I think we've been extremely su successful. We've uh, surpassed all the goals and targets that they had in terms of number of units. Uh, the, we, we've uh, built more units than they had targeted for us with the money. So it, it proves that we can be very efficient with their dollars. It says just keep them coming and we'll make, uh, continue to create a great number of affordable housing units. But this is important program as well. Um, and it just continues the work that I think and the relationship that we've been having with uh, the federal government that I think started when they announced the support for the capital program at TCHC. I think that was uh, when they started coming into, into the business and obviously the national housing strategy has been a, a great support as well. As it was mentioned in here, we really need to continue to work with the federal government now on the Housing Now program. Um, uh, they have a target of 100,000 units across the country we have very easy over 20,000 units right here right now with uh, great uh, deep affordable housing and for 99 years so uh, I can't see many more deals like this uh, across the country this is a great deal for them but we need to work together as we've been doing up to now um, to make sure that these uh, these get built so uh, I, I know that our conversations continue to happen and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see some success in the very near future thank you deputy mayor uh, are there uh Others wishing to speak to this report? Uh, Councillor Ainsley. Councillor yep. Ainsley. Yes, either. Thanks. So yep. Go ahead, Councillor. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor Tory. And, and I want to thank you and congratulate you for all of your uh, hard work in advocating both to the provincial government and the federal government. You know, I, I think this is amazing news. Uh, you know, to see $27 million in additional funding uh, committed by the province to the city of Toronto for affordable housing and, you know, in writing uh, the acknowledgement from Minister Clark that the annual cost of the program will grow to $48 million uh, per year uh, by the end of 2023 and a commitment in writing from him that his government will continue to work collaboratively with the City of Toronto. Uh, and, you know, also for your continued work and, and thank you to Abby Bond and her team for all of their work uh, with the federal government, um, you know, the three housing now sites that I mentioned, uh, we need the funding for those from the federal government. We need to get the shovels in the ground. Um, I, I think it's very evident to everybody the need for affordable housing in the, in the city of Toronto. 
families have been hit high by this skyrocketing price of housing, the price of food, uh, even in our first item this morning when we discussed uh, the affordability of internet. Uh, residents that uh, were making their deputations this morning often talked about, um, you know, what was their choice? Should they get a for more affordable internet, find affordable internet, or, or buy food? And that comes as, uh, with the affordable housing as well. Um, people keep coming to the city of Toronto for work. Uh, you know, when we want strong, vibrant communities, we want people working, but we have to house them. And we, people need affordable housing. You know, much too often now, I talk with people from all demographics, but, you know, people coming out of college and university, um, their chief concern after the job is trying to find a place to live. And they need an affordable place. You know, even now, a one-bedroom condominium, one-bedroom apartment to rent, is over two thousand dollars a month uh, when houses housing is going over a million dollars for a house you know it, it boggles many youth coming out of university and college how they're going to be able to afford to live in toronto and we need them to be able to afford to live in toronto to maintain our economy to keep our communities growing um, so this is great news to have this money from the provincial government. I look forward to more money from the federal government. Uh, once again, thank you, Mayor Tory, for all your advocacy and to Abby Bond and her staff for all the tremendous work that they're doing as well. And to Deputy Mayor Bailao for all of her work on the housing portfolio. I know residents across Toronto can't thank you enough. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Thanks, uh, Councillor Ainsley. Anybody else wishing to speak uh, to this uh, matter? I don't see anybody on the screen, don't see anybody in the room. Uh, so then I'll proceed, if I may, uh, to s say a few words. I have a motion, first of all, uh, and the motion is one, uh, as you can see when it comes up on the screen, that simply authorizes the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer to, uh, we always have to do this, we have to actually pass a motion authorizing them to accept money that's coming our way. And uh, so indeed, you're always happy to move those motions. And so that's what this motion does, uh, that it uh, authorizes that in a form satisfactory to the City Manager and to the City Solicitor. And of course, the uh, money that we're talking about here uh, is uh, the money that was uh, 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 contained in the communication that uh, has been referenced by a number of members of the, uh, of the committee uh, and also uh, was to be found in the letter that we received from uh, Minister Clark. And, and I would like to extend a few thanks myself. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Government of Ontario. Um, and it goes all the way to Premier Ford, who I spoke to about this. It extends through, uh, I would say, um, Secondly, uh, Finance Minister Peter Bethenthalvi, who was uh, a steady, consistent advocate for us on this in raising this matter with his colleagues. Uh, and I would say, of course, the minister who signed the letter, Steve Clark, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I want to thank them because, um, you know, I, I think what's going on here, to be frank, is that, uh, you know, we're moving at such a rapid pace, thanks to the help from the federal government on the capital side, that it, 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 the, the speed is something that probably no other government would have had to, to deal with before in terms of having the operating funding in place to, uh, to fund the supports for the residents of this supportive housing as quickly as we're doing. I mean, we have literally gone to point to the success of this program uh, from, from uh, finding a piece of land to having people living in housing on that same land, which was previously a parking lot or just an empty piece of land, in months. In months. It's not been done before. And it wouldn't have happened were it not for the federal government's uh, rapid housing program. It wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been ready to put forward the land. It wouldn't, be happened, it wouldn't have happened if we weren't ready to remove the obstacles to it happening. And then the final piece that had to sort of uh, come our way for at least 2022, and I should put an asterisk beside that, was the operating funding. Because of course this, fund, this um, housing works on the basis that you have uh, people who are not just in a home, sometimes for the first time in a long time. And Deputy Mayor Bailao and I have visited, as, uh, as has Councillor Crawford, because uh, he has one in his area, uh, these uh, uh, developments. And there's soon to be one in Councillor Thompson's, Deputy Mayor Thompson's area. And the pride and the dignity you see on the faces of the people you meet, who maybe for the first time ever have had a home. And by the way, they pay rent. They pay rent. But what they also have there are the kinds of supports that are so vitally needed by some of them to deal with, whether it's the need to get a job or the need to find other housing down the road or the need to deal with some issues they confront that most of us can hardly imagine, like issues of mental health and so forth. 
And I should say that, you know, I think what's happened is that the provincial government, first of all, has perhaps been caught a bit off guard by the speed with which we put these in place, but also I think, especially in the case of, 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 of uh, Finance Minister Bethenthalvi and the Premier, they're starting to realize the business case. The moral case to me is self-evident. You know, why do you want people on the street or in a shelter or in an encampment if you can have them living in this supportive housing where they live in a, a decent, uh, accommodation and have supports that are going to help them get back on their feet. Um, and, and the cost effective business case part of it comes from the fact that the people who are given support in this housing um, in the neighborhoods where we're locating these projects are not visiting the emergency room. They're not, uh, you know, being in, in encounters with the police. They're not, uh, you know, uh, otherwise drawing on resources that we put in place to help people that are experiencing homelessness. And it's a solid business case. And I commend so much uh, Finance Minister Beth and Thalvey in particular for recognizing uh, this fact. Um, and so here we are, and we've been advocating, and I should say, you know, with the help of, I, I want to commend uh, Deputy Mayor Bailao, she's been constant on this, uh, Abby Bond has been constant, Paul Johnson, uh, I, I want to mention Luke Robertson in my office because, you know, I sort of spearhead these negotiations, but he carries the kind of the laboring ore of kind of every day, many times a day being on the phone. Um, and it's just the truth, you know, you don't often credit your staff, your political staff, but he's been doing yeoman service. So we've been doing that. We've been actually doing the work with all the same people I just mentioned, creating the homes and the supports. And we've been advocating to the other governments for the money that we received last night, which helps us for 2022. And meanwhile, I will just point out there are others out there who are of no assistance at all. I never hear a peep from them when it comes to advocating on our behalf to get this money for the supports. Not a peep, not a word. There's no advocacy. They're very busy pouring over old emails looking for non-existent villains. And that's what they do. They pour over old emails looking for non-existent villains and they're never to be seen when it comes to help us with the government of Ontario or the government of Canada. Never to be seen anywhere, ever. And that just proves to me the fakery of, of what is going on here. And I have to say that because, uh, you know, we could use everybody's help in making sure that we get some of these problems sorted out. And I will say, and I, I, know, I know I'm out of time here, that you heard yourself, the public did and the members of the committee did and, and, and the staff know it. The fact is that we're ready to move forward with thousands of affordable housing units as a result of a program into which the city has committed billions, billions of city dollars. And we just need a couple of things to be looked after at the federal level in particular. We need to have a longer term commitment on the support of housing from the province. And they've said in the letter, they're very open to that discussion and it's happening now. And, and the city is doing its part. You know, you hear all this talk about supply. Well, the city is doing its part. These things have moved through our system with record speed identifying the land, you know, getting proponents in place. And so we just need now to have these remaining pieces of the puzzle uh, get into place and we can be making a significant difference, with, which we already are. This supportive housing is housing safely and supportively people today who otherwise would be on the street in an encampment or in a shelter. And we have done much better for them, and I'm proud of that. And that is something that uh, I thank Deputy Mayor Bailo for her incredible leadership on this as well as our city staff. So those are my comments, and I thank you for the extra minute. Um, so we have this motion. If there's no one else wishing to speak, I don't see anybody else waving their hand madly on the screen or in the room. So first I'll deal then with the uh, motion that I have put uh, to uh, authorize the acceptance of this money and the documentation necessary to, uh, to do that. And I'll call the question on that. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And I will then uh, uh, ask for a vote to call the question on the item as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, uh, that brings us to item 32.7, uh, EX 32.7, which is the Civic Lab TO Advancing a Culture of Collaboration and, and Innovation. And we have one speaker on this item, a deputant, uh, Bianca Wiley from Tech Reset Canada. Is Ms. Wiley on the, uh, on the line? So, uh, Ms. 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 Wiley, it's your turn, five, five minutes, and there may be some questions for you, and thank you for being here as always. Wonderful, thank you for starting a timer. Um, so, my name is Bianca Wiley, I'm here, uh, co-founder of Tech Reset Canada, and we're a volunteer group uh, that looks at issues of technology and society. Um, I'm late to this, I only saw this report because I was looking at ConnectTO, so that's my little preface to my four quick points. Um, the first one is, it's great to see the idea of more research being included in our decision processes in government. And I saw in the equity impact statement in this report 
um, sort of making sure that more people are involved sharing but um, and I think that's wonderful but I also want to go back to this morning and on the connect heal file just wanted to identify that um, significant research was done to identify the problem of affordable internet in the city of Toronto and it was like it didn't really exist it wasn't um, brought into the policy in a way it was super visible and so we spent a lot of time on problem definition over the last couple of months and so I guess I just want to use that as an example for a jumping off point maybe an idea um, how do we integrate this report like these kind of research reports into the motions a bit better I think this is just a medium-term civic engagement question I think all of us might see when you open a report and there's just a ton of links at the bottom um, I don't think that really activates this research so I think it's great that it's here but how do we make sure it really like comes into motion um, when we're having our conversations and making decisions together so that's the first point the second one, I just wanted to suggest, I see these MOUs are going to be created. It would be really neat from an open government perspective if anyone wants to ask that that could be a public process. Um, perhaps that those MOUs would be easily available for anybody who wanted to understand sort of the governance constructs and the ideas for how these MOUs are supposed to work. I think that that's just a consistent open government thing for all of us to learn more about how we're making decisions um, as we engage with different public and private actors, just being able to see that and to understand it and possibly help iterate how those relationships look in the future. So that's sort of a, you know, that's a request to consider. Can we make sure that those are open? Um, and then just two more points. One of them, I wanted to share a trend that many of you may be aware of, especially in the artificial intelligence and machine learning communities. Um, that there is significant concern with academic freedom and corporate influence um, just because there's so much private sector funding um, behind so much of what's like super, you know, super prominent right now for research. And I, I would assume the city is also interested in that area. So I'm happy to share a little bit of the literature on that um, with all of you because I think it's an important place just to make sure we're not replicating a little bit of the challenges that that, that area is experiencing today in terms of sort of just ingesting um, research that already has a very specific corporate aim um, into city governance and policy. So I just want to be careful on that front. And then the last point, kind of a similar thing, which is uh, probably a, a older issue, but I think people are generally excited about projects like this where you bring more interaction with different, you know, different people, public, private, let's all look at this from different angles, engage locally. So I feel like the reasons people like programs like Civic Lab TO are pretty well documented. Um, I think the challenges with some of these programs aren't as well documented. Um, so in terms of procurement and a bit of a slippage of oversight, governance, decision making, lobbying, um, there's, there's just an area of concern there. And so I think it would be prudent just to think about how, um, how we want to take some lessons learned from the last decade. You know, I think we've seen these Bloomberg innovation programs, like this stuff is old enough now that I think we can see some contours of where they, these programs are helpful and then also where they struggled a little bit. So on that same note, I just wanted to show up to basically say I'm happy to send along some of the um, recent publications on this, um, some of the issues around legal with procurement and oversight, um, just to make sure that we think about these things, because I think, like I said, the good parts of these programs are well documented. Um, the things that aren't working as well aren't as well documented. So let's just make sure we're doing good lessons learned on, you know, something that's very well intended, but also opens up a little bit of looseness around governance and accountability. So I think that would be um, just something to keep in mind. Um, and that's all. So thanks for the opportunity. And uh, we'll be happy to watch this one as it continues along. Thank you, Ms. Wiley. Are there any questions of this deputy? Seeing none, I will thank you very much for being with us today and for your patience in uh, being heard. Um, and I'll move then to questions of staff. Are there any questions of staff on this report? Seeing none, I'll see if there are speakers. Okay, well, seeing none, uh, I will then ask for, uh, uh, I'll recommend. Uh, Mayor Tori, I'm happy uh, to sorry, move the sorry, recommendations. What was that again? I'm happy to move the recommendations. Oh, perfect. 
That's great. And, and the, the recommendation here, of course, is to authorize the city manager to move ahead and have these MOUs that Ms. Wiley referred to with, uh, and I think we've started to see some real dividends coming from this. So, uh, Councillor Ainsley has moved the staff recommendations, and I'll call the question if there are no comments. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, next, then, is item 32.9, which is the adjustments to the capital budget, carry forward funding, and future year commitments. Uh, and that was held down by Councillor Pasternak. So I'll start first. There are no deputants on that. I will start first, then, with uh, questions of staff. Uh, uh, did you have some questions of staff, Councillor Yes, Pasternak? thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just a few general questions. The numbers sort of leaped off the page a bit. Um, as I understand it, um, the capital backlog is not that we don't have the funding, but we're unable to roll out um, many of these capital projects on a timely basis. Would that be a kind of a fair, a fair assumption of, of what's before us? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Pasternak, it's Heather. Um, Hi. I think a couple of points that I'd just like to highlight. You're correct, the numbers are significant. However, when you look at them, as a percentage of the overall budget, um, it, it was just it was just shy of I think it was 28 percent. That's much lower than what it has been historically. And I think when you layer on uh, the impacts of COVID, when you impact uh, consider the impacts of supply chain issues and the impacts of COVID combined, in actual fact, we outperformed pre-COVID experiences. So I do think that, yeah, the numbers do look large in isolation, but I think it's important to actually consider the context as well. So as I understand this, um, the, the direction you're looking for is some of the projects that were to uh, take place in 2021 uh, may be up to five years behind. They may not be done until 2026, according to what's in front of us. Through you, Mr. Mayor, correct, Councillor. What has happened is the program areas have looked at uh, the status of projects and when the appropriate spend will occur. So uh, Steve might want to speak to very specific projects to give you examples, but uh, there was a recalibration of the expected timing of some of the projects. So to drill down a little bit on why these aren't move, moving forward, are we um, not getting a lot of bids on, on these projects when they go out to tender? Or, or are we finding that, um, uh, that basically our current, our current suppliers don't have the, the staffing levels to get them done on a timely basis? Through you, Mr. Mayor, actually it's a combination of, of reasons, Councillor. Um, the supply chain issues have had a dramatic impact on the ability for capital projects to be completed over the last year. COVID still is significantly impacting our ability to deliver, not just from an internal perspective, but from very much impacted by a supply chain issue. Um, okay. Um, so not to give you a hard time, but it was my understanding that municipally funded projects um, or critical infrastructure projects were not shut down during the pandemic. Is, is, was that a correct reading of, of some of the uh, provincial emergency orders? Through you, Mr. Mayor, correct. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, Steve may want to speak to some of the significant projects that in actual fact encountered delays that would not have been caught by that uh, provincial guidance. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, I can add. So uh, staff are currently in the process of developing our year-end variance report, which will get into the specifics of our capital program, what our spending was for 2021, and, and uh, reasons for any delays and the plans to continue that work into 2022 and future years. This report itself is, is essentially a precursor to that, which gives us the authority to carry the funds over into 2022 or future years to enable us to continue to advance that work. Okay, well, I guess you see where I'm getting at. I mean, councillors promised their local communities capital projects uh, and back in 2021, and they might not see them till 2026. So I just wanted to make sure they under the, the general public and my colleagues under understood the backstory to those delays. Through you, Mr. Mayor, councillor, just I also want to point out that the timing of the project may be over a few years. It might not be. 
uh, to your point, the comment that you just made that a project is delayed until 2026. It just might be the time span it takes to complete the project is spread out over a longer period of time, but it, it may be started. Okay, thank you very much. Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Pasternak. Are there other questions uh, of staff on this uh, report? I just had one because it kind of is a bit of the flip side of, if I may, of, uh, of Councillor Pasternak's questions, uh, Ms. Crawford, um, which is, um, can you report generally on what the trend line has been on the spend that actually has been uh, achieved? Because uh, I think some of those numbers, I believe, in pretty well all categories have actually been improving over the last few years. In other words, when I say the spend that has been taking place, the percentage of the budget that actually has been invested in the year in which it was intended to be invested, uh, I think has gone up. It's still not 100%, but it's, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll start and I'll ask Steve to augment what I'm saying. Um, but we are really proud of the fact that there was an overall 77% spend that compares to a historical 68% spend in uh, pre-COVID times. We've done a lot of work around recasting the capital plan to better reflect uh, the ability to uh, deliver projects. Um, that was not contemplating the impacts of COVID and supply chain issues. Uh, there are areas where we were actually able to accelerate capital plans um, as well. But Steve might just want to add some additional information to that. And I'm sorry, I, I called yeah. on you as Ms. Crawford, not Ms. Taylor. And, and it was just a sort of confusion. Uh, I knew dealing, you met me. <laughs> from, dealing, from dealing with the budget chief so much. Anyway, uh, uh, Steve, over to you, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, we have seen some steady increases in our spend rates and it's been through through some actions that we've done in terms of being able to allow for multi-year commitments to be able to get ahead in advance work. Uh, and there has been that steady increase that we've seen over the last few years. Um, I will say, as we're looking at the numbers, we know there were some challenges late in 2021, uh, mostly because of supply chain issues and things of that, that matter, which has, has stalled the, the, the growth a bit in our spend rate, but we are continuing to see that positive trajectory. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I'll see if there are any speakers on this matter. I don't see any. And so as a result, I think that could bring us to um, ask uh, if Councillor Crawford would move the uh, budget committee, uh, the budget committee recommendations uh, that uh, call for the reallocation of some of this money as provided for in the report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, move. yeah, I'll, I'll move those, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so moved by Councillor Crawford. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, carry. Okay, uh, then uh, next we're at 32.10, uh, and that was held down by uh, Councillor Crawford, and we have no deputants on that, and so I'll uh, then move to questions of staff. Are there questions of staff? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I do have questions of staff. Please go ahead, uh, Councillor Crawford. Um, so I believe uh, these questions are directed to the CEO of TO Live, Clive Wagner. I believe he's in the uh, in the chamber, so I'm just curious if he's uh, at the mic at this point, as I can't see him. There he is. He's motoring down the uh, the aisle, uh, Councillor Crawford. And he's coming to the microphone. There he is. Welcome, uh, Mr. Wagner. You're doing a great job too, by the way. Thank you for that. All right, go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Clyde. Um, Clyde, can you talk a bit about um, the findings of the community consultation? You were and your team were uh, very active, uh, even during COVID, over the last couple of years on the consultation. So you can just go, and it's in the report, but you can just go over generally. Um, you know, you, you talk to the St. Lawrence neighborhood, the BIA, the cultural sex sector, uh, the vision, and what you heard from the overall broader and local community on the vision and what we want to do. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, the, the, uh, we began a consultation over two years ago, and the consultation was robust. We worked with our partners at CreateTO, and I know that I think Gabriella is on the line, and uh, uh, obviously our VP of the Redevelopment Project, Leslie Lester, is here with me for questions as well. We found that the community came out uh, in many different ways, and during COVID, we obviously had the same restrictions and, and challenges that other people did while doing uh, consultation, but I think that the team, <coughs> along with our consultant, did an excellent job in reaching out to the community, Kerr Smith, and uh, they came through in both our community surveys, our online work, you'll notice that there was a website, there were detailed phases, phase zero, uh, with a closed group of people that came to the table representing all different community <coughs> groups, both in the local community, 
uh, and across the GTA, then also in phase one, where we, uh, Kerr Smith led the, the community consultation report, and that uh, took the entire summer to go through. For, from those findings, you'll see in the re supplementary report that we gave to council, that there were some very big details that the community wanted for this building. And they are, I am very happy to say, in some ways they actually aligned very nicely with some work that uh, when I first started this job over five years ago that Councillor Pam McConnell and I talked about that she wanted in the community as well. Number one was an extension of park <coughs> space and public space for the building. They wanted these, they were critical. This is exactly what the community was looking for. It is culture in a big C, capital C, culture for all of the community, not just the artists of the community. So those were fundamental in what they were looking for. Then technology was really critical. We found over COVID uh, that this was critical for artists to reach their audiences and will only continue to be so as we move into a post-COVID period. And then a replacement and addition for artists' studios and rehearsal halls. I'm sure the council, uh, councilors are aware of the loss of a lot of these facilities, both in the distillery district in the downtown area and in the West End uh, for all different areas of the arts community. And those had to be added to it. And then finally, in addition, uh, an augmentation and a renovation of the, of the theater spaces that are in there. Thank, thanks, Clyde. Um, next question. Uh, you, and we're all aware that the state of good repair is upwards of $40 million uh, at this point. Um, so can you talk a bit about, um, and this comes into the consultation as well, but would a renovation be able to address the, the, the current limitations on the existing building, primarily on a vision of what we're trying or what you are trying to achieve based on a lot of the consultation? The quick answer would be no. Uh, a renovation would keep the building as is. It would have, uh, and the, under the renovation that we've undertaken, it just so that I'm sure the council is aware, but just to recap slightly, we do uh, regular building condition audits on all of the buildings that TO Live manages for council. Uh, so up at the Meridian Arts Center, the St. Lawrence Center, and Meridian Hall. They are kept up to date. The most recent one is in an attachment and supplementary to this report. It's from 2016, it's a 10 year audit. That audit looked at the building base condition. We also have an AODA audit for the building, uh, for the St. Lawrence Center. Those are, are basically up to date. And that's how we get to the number that you were referencing. It's actually closer to 60 at this stage. Uh, but the one thing that is not covered in that, uh, in that consideration is the um, environmental uh, impact and the environmental renovations that the city is targeting. I can't remember, what, I'm looking at Josie for the date and year that that impact is supposed to be targeted for, but those for all new buildings are also supposed to be implemented. So that's not done yet. That study has yet to be done. Uh, that would only allow us to get the current building back up to a usable state. So it would not include the technology that the community is asking for. It would not include any public spaces in the building. It would not include any of the park extensions that the public is very robustly interested in. It also would not include any of the artist studios or the augmentation of the rehearsal halls. The current one in the space is less than adequate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Last question. Um, let's talk a bit about the next steps. Um, you know, where do we go from here? We're, again, we're not um, digging or breaking ground at this point. A lot of work still has to happen. We again, when, even just on the funding side of that, this is something that will not be happening without the uh, other levels of government and the private sector, in fact, supporting this. So, can you just give uh, uh, the executive a sense of we approve this today? Council approves this. Where do we go from here, and what are, what are the next steps? And thank you very much for the question through the mayor. Uh, obviously, this is a stage gate process and we're working with our partners at CREATIO. Uh, the next step is the next phase. We're looking for an international design competition as outlined in the report given to you. Uh, this is uh, just to take, and you've done this, you've done this through multiple different projects before. And so this is an exciting time. I think we need to bring in 
the professionals, bring in the architects and the people who are the dreamers within the context of what we've laid out. We've put the building blocks of what the community needs are there. We need to then ask the creative uh, architectural and building design people to come back with suggestions. And through that process, we'll overcome some of the questions and hurdles that were raised in the community consultation process and give back to the city a truly cultural and public asset that they're looking for in the downtown core. Uh, we have had support, obviously, through not just uh, the community new users, but also the existing users through the, uh, through the consultation process. Everybody is on board for the building blocks, uh, but now we need to look beyond that and move to the next phase. Uh, and just quickly, Tommy, do you expect this report to come back to Council in the next year, two years, year and a half? Do you, you have a sense of that at this point? The timing is to come back to report uh, on Council in the first or second quarter of 2023. Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor, those are my questions. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Crawford. Are there others wishing to ask questions of, uh, of staff or uh, of Mr. Wagner or anybody else who on this, uh, on this report? Well, there's lots more work to be done by the very same uh, people, but uh, this is a kind of a way station, an important way station along the way. And I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wagner, for being here today and for uh, the work that you've done to get us to this stage. Thank it's you. Exciting. Okay, uh, that would bring us to speakers. Are there uh, speakers on this matter? Councillor Crawford, do you wish to speak? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I do uh, very quickly. Um, again, I think a lot of us know that the uh, St. Lawrence, and if you have been there or not, uh, I mean, I suggest you, you get an opportunity to get, a, to get over there, but it was built 50 years ago. It was a centennial project. Um, it was a jewel and continues to be a jewel for the not-for-profit arts and cultural groups in Toronto. Uh, it's smaller theater groups like Canadian Stage, uh, an important venue to form. Um, and it has met an important need and needs to continue to meet an important need. But again, 50 years later, we're looking at a building. It's tired. It does not meet the needs of a changing city and a change in arts community. Um, and as Clyde said, there's uh, upwards of over $60 million that need to go in this. And this is really primarily just to keep the lights on. So two years ago, City Council did ask TO Live and of course create TO to reimagine the St. Lawrence Centre as a state-of-the-art cultural and civic hub. And to inform that vision, they've been listening, as Clyde had mentioned, to a diverse and growing St. Lawrence community, um, the not-for-profit uh, groups, cultural groups, to understand really what the vision is and, and what we want to accomplish. There were four key principles that are in the report that um, were, were talked about. Number one, we want to ensure a dynamic and flexible space. Um, number two, extreme usability. When you're looking at something like the St. Lawrence Centre and even you know across the street um, with Meridian Hall, we have utilization rates of around you know, 20, 30, 40%. Um, we want to have the, this building used seven days a week to almost 24 hours a day. We want to create a bold and opening building for the neighbourhood. And of course, we want to have a future-facing uh, building for a decarbonized yeah, okay, world. This vision also includes the heritage value and the character of the St. Lawrence Centre. Uh, the renewal of the St. Lawrence Centre for the Arts. Presently, there's an opportunity to create that centre for, for, for arts and a cultural performance centre in downtown Toronto. I also want to thank TO Live staff, Create TO, and the community. There's been an incredible amount of work that has gone into this point, and, and they've done a tremendous job, and I know they'll continue doing that in the, uh, in the future. Next steps, of course, as Clyde has pointed out, um, this is a stage gate process. We're looking at detailed designs. We're looking at costing. Um, and we're identifying the funding partners, which of course will be the city, of course will be the other two levels of government, and it, it will also include a private co component. Um, I do want to comment too uh, briefly, uh, I know the recommendations do talk about looking at the potential of a renovation and, and I understand that that, that as, as part of any sort of project has to be looked at that. But it's not the TO Live nor is it uh, the board and, and my sense that this is something that needs to be done. We really need to look at a rebuild. I recognize the, the, um, the cost of this is, is, is quite substantial. Uh, but again, we're looking at different partners. But again, that will be coming back to us hopefully in another year, year and a half, to really get a good sense is, is can we achieve the vision that I think is really important for the St. Lawrence Centre. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that report. And Mr. Mayor, I'm looking forward to uh, support on executive. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Crawford. I apologize for having left my microphone on there. Uh, uh, so uh, we have heard from Councillor Crawford. Are there others wishing to speak on this uh, report on St. Lawrence Centre? 
Okay, well, again, I will just say a word only so far as to say thank Councillor Crawford for his leadership on this and thank the uh, staff and the board of, uh, of uh, TO Live uh, and all the people that have helped, including many members of the public who have uh, weighed in on this. And I think it's important to note two things. First, um, this is a way station along the way, and, and there's been work done now to present us with what I think was an imperative alternative to putting 50 or $60 million into a building to sort of fix it up. You know, they, they say when it comes to your house or your car, there comes a point in time where maybe it's not the wisest uh, to keep pouring money into it to, um, you know, keep it in a state of good repair. And given the changing circumstances, changing needs, changing times, plus the $60 million bill, um, I think it is time that we did exactly that, and that's what uh, TO Live has done. And so they put in front of us the alternative. And the alternative um, is expensive and it looks expensive, but I, I guess we have to look at it in, in, in the context of the first point, which is that it is the responsible thing for us to do to say, well, what would we get if we started over and did something new? And what's involved with that? And that is what they're gonna go off now and, and, and really pursue in detail. But the second thing I think we have to remember is that um, an investment made collectively by us all, including many people I, I would suggest in the private sector, and this is part of what we'll come back is, uh, exactly how much of this money would be uh, would come by way of donations from people in the private sector, as has been the case with all of these major uh, kinds of projects. And the question is, what is that doing for the welfare of the city overall? And I would argue that uh, any of these kinds of investments in the arts and culture are not only fundamentally important to these, the health and vitality of our arts sector and, and of artists and of arts organizations, but that it is fundamentally important to the rest of our economic development. And I, I say this many times, including at the Mayor's Lunch for the Arts just a week or so ago, that our reputation for embracing creativity, embracing artistry, and so on, is fundamental to our reputation for innovation and for embracing innovation, which in turn is fundamental to attracting the best and the brightest from around the world to come here um, and to invest here and to create jobs here. You know, some of that may have nothing to do directly with the arts, but it has a lot to do with people who want to come here. A healthy arts sector sends a message it not only benefits us in terms of the health of our city at home and the health of our, uh, of our values and the things that, uh, uh, that lie at the very root of our quality of life, but also they send a powerful message to people from around the world who we need to come here, to live here, need them to come here, uh, to invest here and to create jobs here. And so I would say that when you look at something like this, there will be those who will say, well, that's very expensive and is that a really necessary expenditure for the arts? Or they will say, wouldn't we be better off to spend that money on something else. And I think these choices are false choices. We're gonna assess whether or not this new project makes sense or not from all the standpoints that are gonna be covered in this next report. But I think the notion you wouldn't even consider it because somehow it looked expensive, which it is, or because somehow that you always had other priorities, which we do, um, it doesn't mean that you have to make a sort of an either or choice. And I think we force ourselves often into those false choices here when in fact our job is to look at each of them, I think in parallel, and then determine are they in the best interest of the city in many different respects and then go about finding uh, the resources to get them done uh, even if it's over a period of time. So I would uh, commend this report which is really more of one of telling us where we are today and going forward to do additional work uh, so as we'll be uh, put in a better position to make uh, uh, decisions down the road. Uh, and uh, so on that note if there's anybody else that wants to speak now's your chance otherwise we will proceed to um, just having a look here. Was there a motion that was that Councillor Crawford? I can't remember now. Did he put a motion on this? I don't think so. There's a supplementary report, but I don't think there's any other uh, motion. So I think we can just take the uh, recommendations uh, and ask somebody, uh, I'll ask Councillor Crawford, given his great interest in this, uh, to move the recommendations contained in the report and the supplementary report. Councillor Crawford, that's okay with you? Yep. All right. Yeah, I'll, absolutely. So we'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, uh, that then brings us to, uh, I believe I'm right in saying item 36, uh, 32.16, uh, which is Empower TO. Uh, and uh, we have uh, some deputants. We have one more recent addition as a deputant, so we have three in total. And so I will call on them now and ask if. Uh, uh, for having me here today. So my name is Jacob DeWong. I'm a member and advocate with More Neighbors Toronto, and I'm here to ask that you vote Jacob? against this motion to dissolve the OLT. Jacob. Jacob, sorry, this is the host. Um, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pause for a moment, as it appears that we've lost the feed to YouTube. So 
uh, any members of the public who are watching on YouTube right now cannot hear or see this meeting. Uh, so if you can just give us a moment to troubleshoot, please. Thank you. Testing one, two. To the chair, we believe we fixed the issue. Uh, the deputant can resume their deputation. Thank you. So, with apologies there, Jacob, I'm sorry, we just lost our, you may have heard the uh, uh, staff, a city staff member here telling us we lost the feed to YouTube, so it meant your deputation was not being heard by those who are join, uh, joining us from the public today on the YouTube feed. So if, if you wouldn't mind starting over again with apologies, uh, we uh, have these problems, as you know, from time to time when we're doing these meetings virtually. So back to you and we'll start the clock again. Thank you very much. For sure, yeah. Second try is the charm. That's how the saying goes, right? So yeah, thanks thanks everyone, Mayor Tori and members of the executive committee for having me here today. So uh, my name is Jacob DeWong. I'm a member and advocate with More Neighbors Toronto, and I'm here to ask that you vote against the motion to dissolve the OLT. And to start off, it's impossible to talk about the OLT without talking about the housing crisis. Uh, the housing crisis in Toronto continues to get worse, but at this point, it's not only a Toronto problem. It's a region-wide crisis and has spread to the entire province. For me personally, I am 25 years old, I'm a renter, and I earn a good salary by any measure. Myself and the vast majority of my friends cannot imagine being able to afford to stay in Toronto long-term. While some may pretend otherwise, local planning decisions in Toronto have region-wide effects. Planning decisions in the city of Toronto have ripple effects that don't end at Steeles or Etobicoke Creek, and already decisions it made in Toronto are negatively affecting the entire region and causing interprovincial migration out of the city by thousands each year, my friends among them. At the very least, the OLT provides some kind of check and balance to ensure that the city is accountable for the regional level effects of its planning decisions and that the city is accountable in some way to the thousands of people its planning decision forces out of the city each year, not just to the hyper-local interests that seek to block desperately needed housing at every turn. This is why the OLT is so important. Now, what would replace the OLT if proponents of this motion get their way? Well, if you read Fontra's letter, the OLT re replacement would give more control to the municipal planning process and appeals would be limited. Uh, contrary to what the proponents claim, this is hardly democratic, as the municipal planning process is known to systematically exclude the voices who suffer most from the housing crisis, such as those who do not have the time to follow every single planning meeting, or my friends, for example, who are forced and priced out of this city. On the second page of their letter, Fontra says in their version of the OLT replacement, and I quote, we believe property owners should have a right of appeal to planning decisions to the OLT, not renters, not tenants, property owners. Whether this is intentional or subconscious, this paints a vision of a neo-feudal future where mostly millionaire property owners and those lucky enough to have bought into Toronto years ago have even more power to say, not in my backyard, at the expense of everyone else. That's not the future I want for Toronto, and I hope that this is not the future you want for Toronto either. I want the future for Toronto where everyone is welcomed. Dissolving the OLT would hurt mo the most, those most affected by the housing crisis. And so I urge you to vote against this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for those deputations. Uh, and uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Okay, well, we thank you very much for your patience and for your comments, much appreciated. Uh, the next deputy is Jeff Kettle.
Is Mr. Kettle uh, with us? Okay, uh, Jeff Kettle, you're welcome uh, to be here at the Executive Committee. You have five minutes to make your comments, and there may be some questions after that. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, uh, Mayor John Tory and members of the Executive Committee. Um, as the previous uh, deputy uh, said, uh, we, we were expressing actually not complete support for the motion, but qualified support. The motion is that City Council request the province to dissolve the Ontario Land Tribunal and replace it with a true appeals body that only grants hearing based on an error in law or procedure. Our qualifications are as follows. We agree the Ontario Land Tribunal is an unelected, unaccountable, quasi-judicial body that has final say over planning matters in Toronto and across Ontario. The current provincial government has firstly amalgamated the form of five separate tribunals into one, the Ontario Land Tribunal. And secondly, they've given it final say powers, reversing the advisory powers given previously by the previous government to the local planning appeal tribunal. And procedure, thirdly, procedural changes have reduced the involvement of participants, whether it's residents, um, tenants or anybody in the hearings. As a result, it appears that the OLT has become more politicized, more distant from the concerns of regular folks and less knowledgeable of land use planning principles than ever. To make matters worse, Bill 109, More Homes for Everyone Act, recently passed by the Ontario government, appears likely to result in an increased number of development applications going directly to the already backlogged OLT, as, as indicated by staff in their report to Planning and Housing Committee a few days ago. Adding um, delays in approvals and increasing costs for both developers and the city ultimately resulting in housing supply being delivered more slowly and at a still higher price. So while the call to free Toronto from the OLT, frankly, is not new, and in fact goes back over several council terms, um, right now the concerns about the impacts on the city's ability to make its own planning decisions have significantly increased. Fundamentally, we are concerned about democracy and the, the rights of, of regular citizens. However, we do not subscribe to complete elimination of the OLT. We believe it can serve a useful function, both to ensure a better planning process and protect against arbitrary municipal decisions. However, its role needs to be better integrated into the planning process. We support an OLT that, one, ensures conformity of municipal official plans with provincial planning policies, Secondly, allows appeals of failures to update municipal official plans. And thirdly, allows appeals of area-wide policies on grounds of nonconformity with provincial planning policies. Official plans, if they were kept updated, should be the, the guiding planning documents. We believe property owners, and of course, tenants should, too, should have a right of appeal of planning decisions to the OLT, provided that the grounds for appeal are limited to nonconformity with planning policies as set out in the municipality's official plan. Let's, we, let's put the municipality back in the driving seat, not being over, overtaken, overreached by the province. We urge you to support a council resolution urging the province to amend provincial legislation to limit the role of the OLT. As it stands, the OLT has unlimited powers to override municipal decisions. Its role should be limited to ensuring conformity with provincial planning policies and municipal official plans. Thanks. Thank you very much for hearing our, our deputation. Thank you, Mr. Kettle. Are there questions of the deputy? Seeing none here in the room and none on the screen, I will thank you, Mr. Kettle, very much again for your comments, and uh, we will move forward to the third a deputant on this matter, Bilal Akhtar, I, I believe it is. is. Have I got that right? Mr. Akhtar? Um, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. You're most welcome here at the Executive Committee. You have five minutes to make your comments and there may be some questions for you. Cool, I'll keep it quick. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks, Mayor Tory, for giving me the opportunity to speak as well as all members of the Executive Committee. Um, my name is Bilal, I'm 25 years old and I've never voted in a Toronto municipal election. 
this was not by choice. I just lived elsewhere in Ontario until I moved to Toronto three years ago. Um, the money for rent that I was paying in Waterloo and that my parents were paying for their place in Peel region was directly affected by spillover demand from Toronto, but they didn't vote for any of you either because, well, myself and they were not living in Toronto. Obviously, I'm not advocating that all of Ontario should be able to vote in Toronto's municipal elections, but the well-being of the province's economy is absolutely a provincial responsibility. And Toronto not housing enough people is absolutely a provincial issue with provincial consequences that are being felt by people all around the province and consequences that I felt myself. But now that I live in Toronto and now that I attend public meetings, it is a striking how big a role the OLT pay, plays in Toronto's planning. This might seem jarring at first, but everything that's built in Toronto, and I don't need to be the one telling you this, uh, is built with a site-specific exception. There's very little new housing in Toronto that's built as of right. Uh, it would be nice if that changed, but that's a different conversation. Since everything is a site-specific exception, it really is up to the local councillor and the local residents they're beholden to, to either allow it or to gatekeep. And showing up in a lot of these meetings, we've seen a lot of gatekeeping. Um, there, there are no consequences to them to saying no. Well, there would be no consequences to them saying no if it weren't for the OLT. When I go to these meetings, and when I went to these meetings before becoming a Toronto resident myself, I would often see the invisible hand of the OLT be the only voice representing my interests in these meetings. So many of my friends live in buildings that are only there in Midtown Toronto because the, it went to the OLT and it got approved there, or back then it was called OMB or LPAT. And I know the naysayers say a lot about local democracy or giving quote unquote regular citizens uh, like a voice in the process. But to them, democracy is really only when they and only they have an outsized voice over people like me. Uh, you know what's an unelected, unaccountable body with strong powers over Canada's economic, educational, and cultural hub? Certain residential associations, like those that want to restrict appeals just to property owners, as mentioned by previous speakers. If groups like these want to have representation from regular citizens, they can start by having representation from a diverse range of groups, such as tenants and minorities from the world's most diverse city as part of their own groups. And then we should see where that goes. I am also not a fan of Bill 109. I do agree that it will flood uh, the OLT with lots of applica applications just because it didn't meet the statutory timeline. Um, but taking away the OLT's checks on the city's power is a terrible idea. Maybe projects like supportive housing at 175 Commer should not be appealable, but your cookie cutter, low rise, mid rise, high rise should absolutely be appealable because that's an important check on hyper local interests that can often dominate city politics. This is why I ask you to vote against this motion. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akhtar. Are there questions of the deputy? Okay, well, um, having uh, no more questions for the deputants and no more deputants to be heard from today, we could move to questions of staff. Are there any questions of staff on this matter? Okay. Um, in the absence of the deputy mayor who had planned to be here, but he filled in for me this morning when I was, uh, when I was uh, absent because of a declared conflict, uh, he had a motion which I'm happy to move on his behalf. And uh, I think it could uh, then dispense with the item, uh, hopefully to the satisfaction of the members of the committee. Uh, and that is, and I'll put the, ask that motion be put up if we could, uh, that the item be referred to the chief planner and executive director of city planning and city solicitor for further consideration and a comparison between the city's success rate at the Ontario Land Tribunal versus previous appeal bodies. So that is the motion. And I just think that's a way in which we can get further information to take uh, this particular sentiment where we've heard both sides, I guess, as it were, even today in the deputations, and get some further information to better equip uh, all of us as decision makers to uh, decide on the right approach to take. And that might involve also a little more of the passage of time since the land tribunal itself is a fairly recent, uh, a fairly recent uh, addition to the scene. Uh, so I'll see if there's any questions of the mover or if there's any uh, other comments others wish to make, and otherwise I could call the question on this. Any other comments by anybody? Just looking at the screen, I don't see anybody. Looking in the room, I don't see anybody. So I'm ready to call the question on this then, uh, on this motion, uh, which we can put back up. 
There it is. Uh, okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. I believe, uh, Julie, that brings us to the end of our business for today. Unless anybody else has anything else they need to speak to or that we need to raise. And I'll thank you all for your patience today uh, on the Executive Committee and the members of the public for their patience and our staff, of course. And uh, we will uh, see you at City Council, if not before. Thank you very much. Meetings adjourned.